Good evening and welcome to the regular Planning Commission meeting of June 14th. Recording in progress. Oh. Good evening and welcome to the Planning Commission of June 14th. Um, Ms. Dow, could you take the roll, please? Chair Suma. Present. Vice Chair Chang. Here. Commissioner Aiken. Here. Commissioner Liu. Here. Commissioner Heckman is absent. Commissioner Rechtal. Here. Commissioner Templeton. Here. We have a quorum. Thank you so much. And at this time, I'd like to ask if there are any members of the public either here or on Zoom who would like to speak to items that are not on the agenda. Uh, no public comments. So seeing that there are no public comments, get your hand up now or we will move on to the next thing. Um, okay. Any agenda changes, additions, or deletions? No changes. Okay, thank you. And then I think it's time for the city official reports. Yes, uh, as noted in the packet, uh, we have some meetings coming up July, uh, sorry, June 28th and July 12th and July 26th. We're targeting um, a number of items for those meetings. We haven't yet set uh, the items for August, uh, but considering possibly looking at the first uh, August meeting as a potential break uh, and resuming at the end of August. So we'll, we have some time to deliberate that later when we look at all of the other items on our, on our plate. Um, Let's see, and we're, we have the last council meeting of the year coming up on Monday, the 19th. Uh, we have a number of items on that agenda, which are consent calendar primarily. Um, so off the top of my head, <laughs> that's what happened. All right, um, and so other staff. Um, if we have other staff that would like to make a report with us this evening. Not. Mr. Uh, Ruiz. Yeah. Hi, thank you, Rafael Rios, um, senior engineer with the Office of Transportation. Just wanted to update on a couple of things. Um, one, the Lincoln Field section, um, the safety assessment that we're in the progress of doing um we've launched the website and um hopefully um it's being showed up there on on the board but um on the website it's going to include the link to the consultants um, assess safety assessment report as well as a notice for a community meeting that's um, planned right now for 6 p.m on um, june 27th it's a thursday uh, tuesday and then also on there is a form to provide input and email addresses. If you you can either email or use the form on there or attend one of the, or the community meetings. And we're looking to get input from many people on that. Um, and then in addition to that, um, the upcoming city council meeting, um, we have a couple of items on the consent calendar, um, including a, a contract for the bike, bicycle and pedestrian transportation plan. Um, and a funding agreement for um, an FHWA um, safety action plan. So just as a heads up, there are two items that, you know, if they pass, um, eventually will be coming the PPC for, for some review. So. Thank you very much for that. Um, and do any of my colleagues have questions for staff? Uh oh. I do have a question for Mr. Rios, but I don't know if we've lost him. Yeah. Sure. Okay. I, I think I'm back. Sorry, okay, sorry. sorry. I thought were um, you finished? I'm sorry. I thought you were finished. Um, I didn't realize you were missing. I don't I don't know when I got cut off. <laughs> um I I was giving an update on the Lincoln Middlefield website and, and information and then a couple of for the couple of items on the meeting agenda. Did I miss I get that off from that? We did hear your update. Um, my question, hopefully you'll be okay. able to answer it, sure. uh, is 
Were the various community members who wrote in in the past regarding Lincoln and Middlefield notified that the website is up and notified about the community meeting? Like, is there a email list of interested community members that has been created? Yeah, so not yet, but we, we, we are in the process of compiling that email list. I know I, myself, I had about 12 that I added to that list. Um, we are sending postcards to the residents within a couple blocks and that should be should have gone out i believe today so we're sending the launch the email right around the same time so the email will go out this week for sure okay great and thank I've, you i've notified a number of them personally so some of the key folks are in the loop already wonderful thank you Okay, if there's nothing else, I guess that concludes this portion and we can go on to our action item, which is item two, public hearing quasi judicial on 800 San Antonio Road, um, etc. So I know staff has a report, so I will turn it over to staff. Thank you. Uh, introducing, although she's been here before, um, Emily Foley, who will present on this item. So this is the presentation for 800 San Antonio, a planned community or PHZ application. So presentation mode. Uh, yeah. Yeah, sorry, there was just a bit of a delay between when I clicked it, when I started talking and when you could see it on your screen. <laughs> so this project is a planned home zoning application to include a new five-story residential building with 76 residential units, 20% of which will be affordable as required by the PHC program. It will include two levels of underground parking with sufficient um, parking for the number of units under the zoning code. However, the exceptions to the zoning code that the PHC is requesting includes a height exemption um, exceeding the typically allowable FAR and lot coverage, the fact that it is 100% residential use and does not include a commercial component where usually mixed use is required in the CS zone. This application will also merge two existing parcels and is located in the housing incentive program area of San Antonio. This map shows the relative location on San Antonio between Lakehorn Street and East Charleston Road. Other projects that um, are nearby and are in phases of the planning or building permitting process include 788 San Antonio, 824 San Antonio, and 3997 Fabian. This slide shows the PHZ process since it has um, pretty much the most hearings one of our application types can have. This project started with a pre-screening in August of last year, and now we have the formally submitted application. It has gone through a couple of rounds of staff review, and this is now the first PTC hearing. After this hearing, it typically would move on to the architectural review board for a couple of rounds of their review before returning to the PTC for a formal recommendation to the city council. In terms of CEQA, this project is in, uh, currently having an addendum to the Housing Incentive Program expansion EIR being prepared. This means we do not currently expect that there will be any new significant environmental impacts beyond what was analyzed as a part of the HIP expansion EIR, but we are still in that process. So if anything new comes up, this will change and this project must comply with all adopted mitigation measures for that previous EIR. This slide shows the site plan. In general, the application is meeting all required setbacks. However, some of the balconies in the rear for some of the units protrude slightly into the required 10 foot setback. This project is also respecting the required 24 foot special setback along San Antonio. And you can see that the driveway is located at the northernmost end of the site. 
These are sample floor plans. The one on the left is the ground floor and the one on the right are the upper floors. Most of the units have outdoor balcony space. The minimum required space for the zoning district is 150 square feet per unit. And this does meet it on an average basis, though not on a by unit basis as not every um, unit has a balcony. The next two slides show elevations. The proposed materials include fiber cement panels, metal panels, metal trim, glass windows, and glass railings for the balconies, and a material sample board is um, here in the chambers tonight. And I mentioned this earlier, but more specifically, this project is asking for exceptions to some of the CS development standards. The project is proposing a 2.99 floor area ratio where 0.4 to um, one is allowed. It is proposing 65% lot coverage where 50% is allowed, and it is not proposing any ground floor retail or commercial use where typically 5,000 approximately 5,700 5, square feet is required. It is also asking for exceptions to the height limit. Typically the height limit is 50 feet, but this um, building would be 60 feet to the top of the parapet and 62 feet to the top of the mechanical enclosure. Though technically the mechanical enclosure would still fit under the 15 foot allowance above the 50 feet for mechanical equipment. Our recommended motion is that you provide initial comments and feedback and recommend that the staff forward the project to the architectural review board. This concludes my presentation and the applicant Mark Donahue is available for his presentation. Thank you. Also, I wanted to acknowledge uh, that Emily Foley is now Emily Collis, which I neglected to mention at the beginning. Thank you. Under happy circumstances. Thank you. <laughs> okay, and should I do from here? Okay, great. Excuse me, it's Mr. Donahue? Uh, Mark Donahue. Mark Donahue, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, and um, I know we had a presentation. I don't know if that's ready to go or if I need to uh, give you a disc. Oh, okay, sure. Oh, okay, great. Um, excuse me, um, and is the applicant gets 10 minutes, is that correct? Yeah, okay, thank you. Are we just loading the presentation? Okay. 15? Okay. I promise it won't take that long. <laughs> okay. Well, please feel free to use all 15. All right. And then should I just ask you to advance the slides uh, for me? Okay. Fantastic. Um, okay. All right, well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for listening to us tonight. And uh, while we talk about the project that has become, we can have become very attached to and hope that you will get attached to it as well. Uh, you're seeing here the view of the project from uh, San Antonio, just slightly to the south of the project. <clears throat> in the foreground, uh, we'll talk in a little bit more detail later about the, uh, um, the no fly zone, as we call it. Uh, that is a easement, a special easement that gives the city a little bit of latitude in terms of future planning uh, along San Antonio. And so 
The things I want to talk about are, of course, things that you're already familiar with. Um, I know in May, you passed the latest housing element and a lot of the points that uh, we want to talk about a little bit right now, we're embedded in that discussion, which is the city's got 6,000 units to try to make up over uh, the next 10 years. <clears throat> and that the parts of the city that have been targeted for that kind of development are precisely like the site that we have here in San Antonio. It's a light industrial area. And a lot of the opportunity sites that were identified were in that same zone. We'll get to that later. It is a match with the future plan development in the area as well. And in fact, there is a project as uh, you've seen that's come through that is underway, that's right next door, that's very similar in scale. Um, and then I guess uh, the last thing is, you can see from the image that uh, we're looking for high-end contemporary design. There should be a material board that uh, you've had a chance to see. And um, we're proposing a very uh, high-end cement panel system that very much resembles stone and uh, conveys that uh, as a texture and uh, as uh, colors uh, to the street. Next slide, please. So uh, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this. The location of course is right there in the red circle. Uh, it is sandwiched between major transportation, uh, major trans uh, transportation uh, infrastructure, and it backs up essentially to Menlo Park. Menlo Park is our back property line. And the area is very suitable, pardon? Oh, Mountain View, sorry. I knew it was one of the M cities. Thank you for that, um, Mountain View. And uh, what is also good about the site is that there's a lot of uh, retail and uh, uh, grocery availability very close by. There are culture ins cultural institutions. And so it's really an ideal spot to place uh, high density residential. So uh, next slide. I got to fix my map here. <laughs> I was deceived. Uh, so the star represents the site. Uh, further to the south, as you know, there are a couple of hotels that have already been built. Immediately to our south will be the new residential project. And then over the course of time, as we'll see, there were are other projects planned for the area. Next slide. And uh, there was some concern about its proximity to existing low scale residential. And we just wanted to show that it is actually a considerable distance from the nearest actual residential zoning. Next slide. And it's, whoops, back one. It's still uh, 350 feet minimum away from any residential use that's currently in play or low, low density residential. Next slide. To the right, Mountain View. <laughs> and, um, but essentially for uh, people who live in Palo Alto, the front of the building is essentially what they will see. Uh, the folks over in Mountain View will, will give them a nice facade, but the primary focus is on the street facing facade on San Antonio. Next slide. So the other unique aspect of this project is that we have uh, applied for the PHZ zoning, so the planned home zoning. And we feel that <clears throat> this is a reasonable approach to the kind of spirit of the, the spirit of the law in terms of what the planned home zoning is for, which is to take a site that's already appropriate for multifamily and just intensify it a little bit more. And so that's where those uh, extra height considerations come in and some of the extra density. It is definitely located on transit corridors that lead to housing or to other housing near jobs and near services. And uh, uh, as we saw in the previous slide, there's Costco within walking distance and then several other uh, shopping centers available also within walking and biking distance. Um, so the PHC, as you know, it provides some flexibility at your discretion for the zoning standards. And so that's part of why we're here tonight. 
And then the challenge, of course, is there's, there's actually several challenges. What is the appropriate density for the site? And we feel that uh, this is appropriate for this particular site. And part of what's driving that is just the headwinds that uh, residential developers are facing in terms of finance costs, in terms of the cost, uh, hard costs for building. And so that extra density can make the difference between a project that pencils and one that doesn't. All right, and so um, it is, as you know, the PhD is limited to commercial and high density residential zones, and this falls under the commercial rubric. Next slide. So uh, the housing element, this is an extract from an earlier draft of it, but I wanted to point out that uh, these uh, particular properties that are highlighted in yellow uh, will show up on this next map. Next slide. And so when you look at the aggregate of all the potential opportunity sites along San Antonio, plus the sites that have either already been developed or are going to be developed, you'll see that we are really sitting amidst a fairly large number of similar neighbors. And so this isn't something that will stick out. Uh, it's something that will blend in with the uh, future quarter. Next. So oh, there's those surrounding uses. There's the Costco few other ones, uh, cultural center, and then of course the uh, hotels to the south. Next slide. So uh, this is the site plan and the area that is highlighted in yellow is that uh, special easement that we spoke of. Uh, even though the adjoining properties may not uh, have this enforced or take advantage of it, we felt it was important to respect that. And of course, uh, working with planning to <clears throat> place the facade of the building outside of that special zone so that the city has some flexibility in the future for creating a corridor on San Antonio that's friendly to bicycles and friendly to pedestrians. Next slide. Uh, the basic form of the building, as you can see, is a donut, uh, kind of a French crawler, if I had to pick a particular kind of donut, um, with the straight sides, the angled sides, being comprised of what uh, I would characterize as sliding formal elements, so that it presents a serrated edge, and then also each of the uh, uh, east and west facing facades are broken down into smaller elements. We'll see later when we look at the elevations that the north and south facades are also broke down, uh, broken down rather, and uh, but to a smaller degree. Uh, in the center, this is the landscape plan, and so there's the buffer zone where no permanent landscaping can be applied, so we have paving. Uh, we do have some utilities that will appear in that zone at the request of the utility company. Um, uh, pad mount and transformer adjacent to our uh, driveway entry to underground parking. And then outside of the buffer zone, there will be some outdoor areas that are part of the building amenities here on the lower left of the page. On the interior of the donut uh, is the central courtyard. And this is important not only for the residents of the building to provide a refuge uh, amidst the hustle and bustle of San Antonio, but also uh, what I'll, as I'll show later, it is a glimpse of that inner sanctum will be made available to the street. Looking through two layers of glass in the lobby, uh, you'll be looking into this green courtyard. And so it actually becomes an amenity for the street as well. So next slide. There's the basic form. You can see on the upper left is the garage entry leading down a ramp. So all of the vehicular parking will be below grade and hidden from view except for the entry ramp. Um, we have a few utility functions that must be on the street uh, per PG&E or the local utility. And then the balance of the facade is either amenities such as the bike room. Then we have that large lobby, as you can see, that it passes through from the front of the building into the courtyard. Um, and then building amenities to the south of that. We do have residential units on the ground floor uh, that address the quieter sides of the building on the south, on the east, and some on the north. Next slide. And this is the second floor. I was gonna say it's a typical floor, but 
The two story high lobby you can see is punching through here at the left side of the screen and there will be a bridge going across. So as you walk by on the street, you will see through that into the courtyard, but also you may see people crossing the bridge and just a sense of activity within the building. Um, for the most part, the rest of the uh, floors, if you fill in that gap, are precisely the same and stack. Um, and so they all have that same level of articulation, slightly different as you get to the top floor. Next slide. And then just to give you a glimpse into the basement, we have a lot of our utility functions there, ones that normally would be up on the street. For instance, the trash room is down here and we understand that that means that we've got to get the trash out of the building up to the street, but that is part of the arrangement we're looking for is uh, private transportation of trash from this centralized trash room, which is out of the way, up to the street where it will be picked up by the local trash service. Next slide. All right, so I just want to talk a little bit about the design principles that we employed here. Uh, one of the things that was part of our early discussions is that the zoning would allow for a four-story high building in its rawest form. And so we spent a lot of effort trying to get our five-story building to look like a four-story building. So uh, if it's not immediately apparent, the kind of white columnar elements are all four stories tall. And that fifth story is a darker color so that it receives visually. Next slide. And essentially it divides the building into the, we can't avoid it, classical order of base, middle, and capital or top. And this, first of all, breaks down the scale of the building so that instead of feeling like you're confronting a five-story wall, it's a one-story plinth, it's a three-story building on top of that plinth, and then a penthouse, if you will, that recedes with a darker color. Next slide. We've also broken up uh, all of the facades, but particularly the front facade with these vertical elements, and they kind of express almost a townhome proportion with uh, deeply uh, shadowed divisions between them where the balconies are, so there's a lot of texture between these projecting elements. And so between the horizontal and the vertical, the facade's broken up into uh, bite-sized chunks, shall we say. Next slide. And then the portal I was talking about, it's two stories high, it's in the center of the building and looking through that blue element there, uh, particular, particularly during uh, certain times of the day, you'll have a clear view straight into this beautiful green space that we're creating for the building. Next slide. And there it is back again, sans diagrammatic overlay. The uh, landscape as well responds to the rhythm, rhythm of the building for the street trees. And it's all in the effort of providing the passerby with an experience of a much smaller building. Next slide. Going through the elevations, this is the elevation that you've been seeing in our rendering. There are the four vertical elements divided by balconies. Further, there are other elements, detailed elements that emphasize that verticality. And then uh, you can see that the color we've selected for the top floor really gives it less presence on the street than those things in the foreground. Um, the top level is primarily composed of long balconies. And, uh, and so there's a sense of much more transparency up there as well, just from the fenestration. Next slide. Here's a diagram of our portal looking into the courtyard. Next. And then this is actually the rear of the building. And you can see that we've taken the same strategies that we've used on the front and used them on the back so that as the surrounding neighborhood changes over time, the appearance of the building from all sides will be pleasing. Next slide. Now on each of the north and south elevations, the divisions are not as small. These ones uh, have the the front of the, or the, excuse me, the side of the building divided into three parts. Same thing though here, what we have is we have the base element, the plinth, if you will, actually comes up in the middle and it's the same material and color. So it divides the building into three parts. As you're looking from the front and the uh, whitish material turns the corner, there's a sense that 
there's a bar embedded in this substrate of the gray podium material and the same for the back. Next slide. On the other side, it's uh, inverse and the only difference is here on the south to provide additional sun protection. We are proposing to have sunshades that are going to shade both the south sun and the west sun. Just a better thermal comfort, a little bit more texture facing our neighbors and actually a little bit more privacy as uh, the neighboring project looks in through the windows, there is these screens that will help to block views into the windows. Okay. How did I do? That was like three or four minutes, wasn't it? Excellent. And uh, happy to answer any questions that we can about the project. Okay, thank you so much for that. And um, I'll go to questions from my colleagues and then we'll take public comment. So I see that um, Commissioner Aiken has questions. Hey, Chair Suma, um, I actually have a fairly long list. Do you wanna do this in two passes or a single pass? Two rounds? Um, we'll start out and we'll see. <laughs> okay. Um, in general, I like this project a lot. Um, the mix of unit types and sizes is excellent. Uh, the high density with zero new office space is very helpful. Um, there's adequate parking. Uh, solar power with backup is a nice plus. Uh, so, this is just a question. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, this is just oh. questions. And we're having a little, you need to get probably closer to your silly mic. But so now is the time for questions. Pardon me. As someone new here, uh, I apologize for the uh, out of order comments. Oh, sorry. I thought you, it was a preamble to a question. So. I'm waiting for that question. All right, so we'll uh, drop down to the questions. On uh, page A0.1, uh, the proposed unit mix is slightly different from the one that's listed under required parking. And this is also true on A0.4. Um, so I think it's clear what the intent is, but just I wanted to make sure you knew that there was a little inconsistency in the plans. We can make those corrections, thank you. Um, I think the remainder of the questions I have are for staff rather than for Mr. Donahue. So we'll move on. Okay. Um, so the code section 18.38.080 parenthesis D requires projected sale or rental prices for PC districts. Um, do we have those? So these will be for sale, but um, I think the uh, actually the actual sales price is probably uh, something that will fluctuate between now and the time that it's open. Yeah, this was strictly a question about conformance with the code okay. rather than. Um, something we needed immediately. Okay. Um, much of the parking is stacker system. Do we have a sense of how well that's worked out elsewhere? Uh, so my office has quite a bit of experience in the use of stackers and uh, it is definitely a careful consideration for who is the stacker provider. Because as uh, if you're familiar with stackers, the uh, city, city lift, which was the largest local provider has gone bankrupt. And so we have been relying on uh, uh, providers who have been in the market for much longer and have proven to have a track record. Um, so I don't have the exact specification. It's between one or two providers for that reason. Okay. And my remaining detailed question has already been answered. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Templeton. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate your presentation. Uh, I'm gonna ask a tough question here and <laughs> I apologize in advance. Um, so I noticed that you've got the open space on the ground floor, which is awesome. And I wondered why there's not a, a plan for open space on the roof. And I, I'm guessing because of height restrictions or something, but I just wanted to ask you to speak to that. Well, uh, I think that the answer is actually uh, several fold, but I'll start with 
the easiest one is just the cost. Uh, the cost of doing a shared roof deck rather than focusing on private open space is really prohibitive these days. Um, so that's just one element of the three. Uh, since these are higher end uh, market rate units, there's also the sense that those who live on the top floor and who are uh, frankly probably paying top dollar would not be necessarily open to having the, uh, the roof over their unit uh, since these will be owned units with a shared space on top. So that was a second uh, minor consideration. Um, the other thing is this, uh, it complicates the exiting to a great degree. Once you have a certain population, now you've got to bring the elevators all the way to the roof. You've got to have both of your stairs go to the roof. And even though this is a market rate project, we were still trying to be cost conscious about those items. So what we did instead is in addition to having the courtyard, which is uh, also more protected, uh, there are op there's open space on the ground floor facing the street that is behind a fence line, but is still a shared amenity of the building. And those that's associated with the fitness center and with uh, the uh, office space down there, the work share space. Thank you for speaking to that. The other question I had was, uh, and I'm sure this will go into more detail with this with the ARB, but I just wanted to ask, cause I'm curious on the front facade facing San Antonio in the rendering, it appears to be wider and taller than the building walls itself, like uh, where it extends beyond up here right the, the little blade there yeah um i wonder if you could speak to that certainly so you know one one of the challenges we have as architects uh is there are certain ideas that we're trying to express ideas about how the building is composed formally like what's it made of when you look at it as passerby we we have certain intentions for it we want you to think of it as heavy light uh warm, cool. And so those little flanges at the end are intended to give the sense that these elements in the front, the white, and then there's the blue canopy elements and the blue blades are actually embedded in a plane rather than in a block. And the real reason for that is it gives the building a sense of lightness. And uh, the secondary reason for it is that it takes a little bit more of the street noise out of the, uh, sides of the building as it goes back. It, uh, it did suit a purpose comp uh, compositionally where it gave us a uh, broader surface to work with in terms of embedding our elements along that facade. And so when you put all those things together, we tried it out. We did experiment, of course, without it, with different conditions, and this is the one we arrived at. Okay, so there's some aesthetic principles at play. Do you think it, it in any way, um, contributes to the height discussion or are those have matching things of the matching height behind them you know it's a it's actually a very good question because um immediately behind it's relatively the same height it's a little bit lower because the parapet's a little lower but uh, in terms of the overall composition were we to have expressed that as a solid block rather than as a plane i think that the overall the feeling of mass of the building would have been more pronounced. And even though height is a concern, um, you know, once we went to the darker material as a foil to that, we felt like we, we should commit to it and also make it feel lighter in massing ways as well as in color. Thank you for taking the time to explain that. Thank sure, you. great questions, thank you. Commissioner Chang. Thank you. A um, couple of questions for you. So your picture on the front shows these street trees. Yes. And when I look at the tree and the landscape planting plans, um, well, I'm not sure I was reading them correctly, first of all, because it was pretty small and my old eyes, even, <laughs> even with glasses, were struggling. I totally understand, um, bright lights. So if you look at the tree protection plan on T2 and then, oh, I don't think I marked it properly. 
but there's a landscape plan also, but I think I'm just going to go with T2. Okay. Um, so T2 shows which trees are being removed. Are there actually going to be street trees replaced? Because at least on the T2, I don't see any, um, I don't see any replaced. And when I look at on, on page T2, there's the tree removal summary and then the total trees to be mitigated and trees to be planted. And when I count up the trees that are to be planted as part of the project, I only count the six that are in the, um, the, do the, the donut hole. I see. Yeah. You know, I'll be honest, the landscape architect is not here tonight. Um, and so it is a question that I will have to study before I can answer. I would hate to answer incorrectly. Um, the discussion as it has proceeded this thus far is that we're going to have street trees because it's a requirement of the streetscape design, but the fact that you're not seeing them is giving me pause. Okay, because I do have additional questions regarding the tree replacement um, and tree removal table. Um, yeah, so... I was concerned because it looks lovely with the street trees there. Does, I'd be very concerned if there were no street trees because it would look rather like a concrete block without the street trees. Um, and I didn't see them planted. And then when I looked at the kind of trees to be removed, the quantity that were, are required to be mitigated, and then the actual quantity that are actually going to be planted as part of the project, uh, the quantity required looks like 20... 28, and then the actual trees to be planted is six. So then I had a question for staff, which is how does that work? It looks like there's a fee that's paid. Right, so um, as a part of helping to streamline projects, there are still um, certain staff comments that have not been fully addressed yet. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't have it up in front of me, but there are some urban forestry items, just generally speaking, that will need to be addressed. Um, but on sheet A1.1, it also shows um, four proposed trees in the front setback, but I've noted down um, just in general, the consistency issue. So that will uh, I see. be right. incorporated That's... into our comments. Okay, and then I guess a follow-up question for staff. So what happens, I mean, it's more of a city issue, but if we were to say, put a bike path where those street trees would be, then we would have to figure that out, right? I mean. <laughs> yeah, I mean, a, a simple answer is we would figure it out. <laughs> okay. Um, and then I guess a question for Mr. Donahue. Donahue? Donahue. Okay, Donahue. Um, is there any... Like, I, I understand the need to, there, there's just very, I understand the desire to maximize the FAR here. It's wonderful how much housing is being built. Um, but when I looked at city councils, or when I looked at the city council minutes for the pre-screen, there was a lot of concern about um, this San Antonio corridor and how little greenery there is in this area of Palo Alto, which I think is partly the reason why Commissioner Templeton asked about, you know, uh, open space on the top. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything else that can be done uh, in the back or elsewhere to add greenery? I'm certain there is. I think. Uh... We have several other constraints that are binding us. Uh, the subterranean garage, of course, means that anything within its footprint, you, you really can't grow trees within the footprint. Um, as I understand it though, the uh, special setback is meant for some kind of a master planned greenway or, you know. Bikeway, yeah. Bike lanes and, uh, and so, we were constrained from placing any permanent, such as trees, anything permanent within that uh, setback. And that's actually where we typically would have focused most of the landscape. Um, I do think that there's opportunities to do smaller interventions, but as far as like large trees, very limited at this point. I think okay. the street, street trees uh, will have to uh, take up much of the burden. And then a follow-on question for staff. So um, if not all the trees that are 
need to be mitigated are able to be planted on site. How does that work for um, my education? <laughs> yes, there is an in lieu fee that can be paid based on the um, radius, based on the size of the trees being removed. Okay. Um, and then for Mr. Donahue, a question about traffic circulation. Yeah. How does it, so you had mentioned that the trash refuse would need to be moved up from the garage. Correct. So then it would be picked up where on the street? Currently, like, can, or can you show like how the entrances to the garage and if you could pull up any diagram of sure. the building? Is it possible for us to bring up the, uh, the site plan shows where we are proposing to have the pickup zone. It is on the street um, and it is just south of the driveway entry. Uh, there is a designated zone for trash on those days, as well as a proposed loading zone for FedEx, UPS, Uber, Lyft, whatever uh, ride share comes in front of the building as well. So if you look, um, the zone, I can't really read the number, but if, thank you, uh, zone 10 is designated for trash. And then just below that is the pickup. Which page is that? A1.1. Okay, thanks. Zone 10. Sorry, while oh. I get there. <laughs> okay, great, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, all right, and then oh, one more question about the, there was a, comment in the staff report about the rear setback and how the balconies encroach a little bit on the rear setback. Can I, I couldn't tell how much the balconies encroach on the rear setback and exactly what that refers to. So maybe you could just keep, I don't know if this, I don't think this it's diagram also shows on, it up. It's on the same page. There's yeah. a red dashed line on your packet on a a 1.1. Yes. Okay. So I did see that, but then how, how much does it encroach into the rear setback? Cause I don't think that. I don't think I could read it. I, I could see it, but I couldn't tell. So it's, it's just a couple feet, right? Like the rear setbacks 10 feet. And then do we know how, how much that's going in? Yeah, we don't seem to have dimensions. The exact dimension. Um, it's a couple feet. I think one foot eight or one foot ten, perhaps. Okay. And uh, you know, it, I'm, uh, I I have to look back at the zoning code. There are some allowances for infringements on the setbacks. I just can't remember if balconies is one of them. And that's for all the upper floors, correct? Um, the balconies are uh, con uh, consistent on all floors. Okay. Um, all right, great. Except in the front. Uh, the top floor in the front, the balconies are much longer. Um, and then on the front, 24 setback. Yeah. Um, there's a patio for the for the lower left unit, does that patio encroach into the front 24? Um, are we talking about on the ground floor? And the the ground floor, yes. Yeah, ground floor, those do not encroach and uh, those patios are associated with community rooms rather than a unit. That's Got it. Sorry. Okay. Um, and then final question, I believe, is, um, so for the BMR units, those are also intended for sale. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Question for staff. How does that work with respect to um, for BMR units? So if somebody buys into a BMR unit and their income increases beyond that, do they have to leave? I can answer that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because um, somebody, and usually we use Alta Housing to do this, has to verify income every year. So it's it's kind of tricky, actually, to be honest. Is that right? Yeah. 
Yes, we do use Elta housing. And I mean, I don't think if somebody, I don't think they'd be kicked out, you know, day one, if that were to happen. I think it's, there's a, there's a grace period of some sort. Uh, that I'm not sure of, but they do have to income verify, but also the, oh, uh, Albert, Albert is here. Is on the yeah, sorry. So um, I, I, I do know that is the process for rental units. Um, I'm going to have to verify uh, how it works for um, ownership units. So I'll, I'll get back to you on that. Okay, thank you. Sorry for the long list of questions. No, those are great, thank you. Commissioner Liu? Yeah, can you talk a little bit more about the side yards on both directions and what that would look like and what the fences or open space might be? Sure, I think that uh, I'm not sure that I would characterize it as open space per se. It's more of a buffer. And uh, each of the units has an outdoor patio. so. There is that as one buffer, and then the zone that's outside of that is either for firefighting circulation or um, as part of that additional buffer between the patios and the fence line. Uh, and it's planted with low shrubs uh, throughout, so there's a sense of greenery there on the sides and the back of the building. We just don't have a lot of trees, again, for the, uh, for the reason of the structure being beneath that. Um, but I think for what we were hoping for, uh, for the people in those units is that uh, as they are in their living rooms, they're looking out onto a space that they have control over. And so if they want to plant, you know, uh, trees and pots or some vines or something, they can do that. But then beyond that, the general impression is of a green zone separating this project from any adjoining project. I'm kind of looking in between 788 and uh, the development and on like the front rendering, it seems like this little inlet, which actually seems much more pleasant and nice than having a tall, oppressive fence, like super cleanly dividing the property lines. I was just, I can't really make it out clearly and I'm not sure what it is in the plans. So sure. Yeah. I mean, typically we would have a fence just uh, for legal reasons. So there's no encroachment onto the property. But the uh, exact nature of the fence is, I don't know that we have that information in this set. Um, typically, we have been trying to avoid uh, tall, solid elements, it, uh, both for air circulation and just for a little bit of visual porosity. We uh, uh, favor something that's either perforated or that is made up of vertical slats. But um, to leave that boundary line between our property and the adjoining property uh, open uh, represents some liability issues, unfortunately. Cool. One more question. Can you tell me a little bit more about the decision not to include retail and whether you considered any designs that included retail? We did, actually. We went through quite an exercise um, both uh, with the planning staff, but also just in discussions with the various committees that we've met with. And the, uh, so my office does a lot of retail. And the one thing that we can tell you is that is isolated retail, like a small pad of small size that's disconnected from other retail will die on the vine faster than almost anything. And especially in this day and age, even in areas that are really busy, there's still empty storefronts just because we still haven't gotten to that point where people are out circulating. You can imagine, we talked a lot about having a cafe that the, you know, the building occupants could use and that the neighborhood could come to, but the actual reach that a cafe, even a small cafe has to have in order to survive financially is much, much larger than just a building or a few buildings. It's really entire neighborhoods. Uh, and the most successful retail will be where there's already people going for other things. Um, those, and we, we do have an example of a, a fairly well thriving retail center not too far away. So when we weighed all those considerations, it seemed that if we really want this to be a space that's active over the long term, then it should be a, a use that the building users have where there's people populating it at various times during the day, that it's an amenity to the building and then let the local retail take care of some of those, uh, uh, yes, to take care of that particular aspect of uh, life on the street. Commissioner Templeton. Hi, thank you. Um, it's been a good discussion and some other questions I forgot when my first round came up. So I just wanna get through them hopefully pretty quickly. Um, the first question was about the garage. 
Um, do you know, I, <clears throat> I apologize if it's in this packet and I missed it. Um, what is the approximate elevation of the site? Um, you mean above mean sea level? Yes. That I do not know off the top of my head. That's okay. The reason I'm asking is um, do, how many how many layers deep is the parking garage? There's two layers. Two layers, and I think it's pretty close. If I if I recall correctly, it's pretty close to sea level. Do you have any concerns in the design about water? No, um, we will have to look at the geotechnical report and respond accordingly. But it's always surprising to me that the way that uh, the water table behaves underground is completely detached from the adjoining water bodies. Uh, this constantly surprises me that except in uh, areas of alluvial deposits where it's porous ground, um, depending on the density of the material, depending on what's between you and the shoreline, sometimes someplace you would expect the water table to be pretty much at the surface. There is none. It just uh, okay. is beyond the borings. But, Sounds uh, like you've thought about it, and that's probably <laughs> enough for me for now. Let you and the ARB deal with the rest. But oh, yeah. um, that's definitely something I want to make sure you're thinking about. Yeah. And then um, <clears throat> thank you to Vice Chair Chang for her comments about the, the setbacks, because I'm, I'm just... <clears throat> Wanted to clarify a few points. So looking at the back setback, the part that touches the Mountain View properties, um, what's back there? What are they facing? That currently is, uh, looks like a window manufacturing plant. Okay. Uh, so it's an industrial It's industrial, facility. but there's probably a 40 or 50 foot deep uh, parking lot where, um, from what I can tell, they set up uh, tests for their windows. Okay, so that's that's what it is for now, um, and that's so it's ten or some close approximation of ten, except for those little corners. Mm -hmm. um, and you said that was for fire uh, access, and I just wanted to follow up on that because I'm looking at the other two, the sides, like uh, I guess the the north and south, whatever the the sides, um, they have a five foot setback. Is that what it five, says on the chart? Five foot, uh, is it five foot from the patios to the fence? There, there is a five foot way that's provided a, around the entire site uh, precisely for firefighting. And so if we've encroached on that, I'll need to check back with the team. No, 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 it does say five foot. I just want to make sure like fire trucks are bigger than that. No, no, they, uh, what they would do is, so there's a combination of things. Um, that would be a very big concern if <laughs> we're trying to get fire trucks back there. Uh, there's several things that you can do in terms of where the apparatus is located and how you fight the fire. Part of what we're using is we're using a higher intensity of uh, fire resistance in the construction. And so you get uh, some passes on that. It's not like this thing is made of, you know, kindling and it's going to go up very fast. Which I never suggested. No, no, of yeah. course. But um, I, I guess that's a little bit, maybe a little bit dramatic, but <laughs> it is... Um, the uh, idea is that you design a building that has certain elements that are more highly fire rated, so there's more time to fight the fire. Most of uh, uh, what we're contending with is how far uh, are you from the pumper truck? And the limit is 150 feet. And so typically we do a hose pull uh, uh, test, like we'll, we'll graphically do it and go through it with the fire department. At the end of the day, they uh, if they don't, uh, permit us. If they don't allow us to get a permit, then we'll have to make adaptations that uh, meet their criteria. And they're very conservative. Um, and we are fine with that. Okay. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to check because that's smaller than uh, many of the sites that we yes. look at. So uh, we just wanted to, to double check. Thank you very much for answering those questions. Sure. Commissioner Rechtal. You have a question about the setbacks. Uh, we have a 10 foot setback in the back. What's going to be on there? Is that going to be just planting uh, shrubs or is it going to be grass or what do you anticipate? Low, primarily it's low shrubs, a mixture of low shrubs and uh, ground cover at this point. So you don't anticipate that people will be walking there? No, and they're precluded from walking back there. It's just for maintenance and emergency access only. Okay. Um, if you look at the design of the patios, they extend out into that zone, but then they're hedged in and uh, we would want to prevent people. And as much of a, a maintenance issue it is, it's also 
nobody wants somebody else walking in front of their patio because it's a disturbance to the privacy. Okay, understandable. How about the side yards? Are they going to be gated? Yes, there uh, there won't be access from the street into any of the site except through a locked gate. Okay, thank you. Okay. Commissioner Chang? I forgot to ask one big question, which is, um, <clears throat> I don't know if you can answer it. Uh, do you know how this project has changed uh, since the, or how it, it has changed in broad strokes, I'm sure it's changed quite a bit, since the city council uh, pre-screen? Uh, I would actually say that for the most part, it's been uh, refinements. That um, in general, when we talked to the city council, they were generally supportive. There were comments, I think if you read the minutes, you know that there were comments and concerns. But uh, seemingly there was an understanding that this site is a good site for this kind of project. And uh, within that context, we have been making those refinements, responding to comments from uh, planning and from the other departments, and we'll continue to do so uh, until the entitlement. Okay, so then very specifically, um, the consistent feedback I heard from all the council members was about deeper affordability. So um, can you speak to how that has changed in what we see now versus what was initially presented? Uh, as a matter of fact, I believe in, I'm just going to check, it's like one additional unit. So we've actually added one more unit to the affordability matrix on the below market rate side since we talked to the city council. And actually it's precisely because of their feedback that we did it. And uh, really uh, uh, as a matter of percentage going slightly over that uh, required percentage, uh, just to, to make the affordability available to that one more household. Do you have a matrix? I had to kind of construct my own, you know, to, um, is based on a little ta hashtags and tallies. Is there a matrix somewhere in the um, plans or report that I missed? Of, of all the units, um, the percent affordability, there's a numerical list on A0.1, if I remember correctly. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> I, I did a little tally. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't read. <laughs> so affordability has basically remained the same with the addition of which unit then? Well, so one of the other things that's changed is the location of the affordable units um, uh, based on feedback again from planning staff and from city council. Uh, and I thought that we had a diagram of that, but I'm, I'm sensing that that may not have been included. Well, there is a diagram on page A0.4 that where I can see the location of every single affordable unit marked and the size of that affordable unit, as well as the level of affordability, like whether it's um, very low income, low income or moderate income. So that is what I did my little hashtag tallies with. Um, but I don't know what it was before. Oh, right. So um, I think uh, I can't, I'm sorry, I can't remember the percentages off the top of my head, but. Um, yeah, it was, it was 20%, now 21%. Yeah. Yeah, we, we, we go over the requirement. Yeah. So we were meeting the requirement before, and then after the city council's comments, uh, the decision was made to exceed the requirement. Okay. And then do you know what level of affordability it was before? In other words, was it all 80 to 120 AMI and now it's steep, deeper affordability or? Um, I, yeah, I just said, sorry. <laughs> I, I couldn't remember exactly before we presented to city council uh, a pre-screening meeting, but after we work with the planning department staff and the recommendation and the communication, so we, we put more percentage to lower income, that direction, yeah, okay. overall. Yeah, okay. that, that was a direction change. Great, thank yeah. you. Thank, thank you. you, that's exactly, a, I just wanna make sure we were responsive, thank you. Um, I see our city attorney. Did you have? I just have an answer to uh, Commissioner Chang's question earlier about um, the, how the ownership program works. 
Thanks. Uh, Alta Housing does an annual check for uh, owner occupancy, but there is no uh, income re-verification for ownership units. Uh, the only requirement is that you're eligible when you purchase the unit, and then when the unit is sold, it's sold at that uh, affordable price again. Thank you for that. Um, I'm not seeing any other lights, but I have a few questions. Um, do all the units have uh, private outdoor space, meaning balconies in this case? Um, yes. They do. Okay. So I heard two different things. And then um, the garbage and loading area are in the public parking part of the street. Is that correct? Um, so the pickup zone, yes, is in the public right of way. And so we're asking for permission to use those zones for the limited time that would be required to get the trash out. Okay. And if I can just add, staff has not yet approved the specific trash pickup plan. It is oh. likely to change. And the loading. Okay. Because, um, and the reason I'm concerned about that is because of future um, needs for safe um, bike lanes in this area, on this street. I and mean, then I may have, I forget where I saw this and I may have it wrong. Are the rear and the front setbacks counting as uh, shared open space? We typically do not count, uh, you, you're not allowed to count areas that are for circulation of any kind as yeah. part of your open space calculation. Okay, so the answer is no. Okay. I, we, I, I'm gonna need to verify that we didn't do it because we shouldn't have, but because it's emergency access, there's stipulations that say you cannot count this. Okay, thank you for that. I thought I saw that somewhere, but I can't locate it now between various documents. And then this is a question that's kind of general in nature, so maybe it's for staff, but at what height level do buildings need to be accessed in emergencies by a ladder truck? Do we know? I can answer that. It, you can? Yeah, it is. It's a function of two things. One is the height, but it's also the construction type. Uh, this particular building is type 3A. And what that really means is that all of the uh, exterior cladding, the structural members have to meet a certain fire code uh, longevity, if you will, one hour, two hour. And so in that case, the fire department does not require you to provide aerial access to the windows because they know they have enough time to go into the building and rescue people from inside the building rather than approaching it from the outside. That's part of the reason that we don't have a fire lane all the way around the building because aerial access is not required. Um, and that is purely a function of how fireproof the building is. Okay, thank you. It was kind of specific to your building, in fact. Okay, I am not seeing any other lights. So I think we can go to members of the public. Um, Ms. Dow, do we have people in the room or online? I have not received any speaker cards or raised hands. No speaker cards. Okay, seeing that, I guess we will just take it back to um, the commission. So um, time for discussion and or more questions. Um, okay, I'm seeing that uh, Commissioner Aker would like to go. <laughs> this time I'll wrap up what I started. Uh, the, uh, the only other uh, thing I wanted to mention that I thought was particularly worthwhile is that managed to achieve all this with relatively few zoning exceptions. Um, it could have been considerably more extreme and we got some value for the concessions that are being requested here. Um, there are two questions that I specifically want to refer to the ARB. So since we're making comments for, for their use as well, uh, one is the courtyard is essentially the bottom of a 60 foot deep well and I wonder if that's going to be appealing to the residents. So I'd like the ARB to give that some thought. Um, and two, um, a lot of effort has been uh, made to uh, modify the massing of the building, but I would like the ARB to consider whether it's compatible with uh, 788 next door. Now, the remaining comment I wanted to make is just a general one because I worked the numbers and was surprised and just thought I would pass it along. Um, the mix of BMR unit types in this project is really very good, uh, but 
like all projects of this kind, there aren't nearly enough units total. So we've, we're fighting this financial issue as well as uh, trying to establish what our policy is. So just as an observation, if every project that's brought before us has this ratio of BMR units, we need 253 of them to meet the RENA requirements. So you can see how far we're falling short um, on what we would like to see. For affordable. For affordable, yeah, for affordable. Um, so just something for us to keep in mind as we try and uh, provide policy guidance uh, in the future. Thank you, that's all. Thank you, let's um, go to Commissioner Templeton. Thank you. Um, yeah, I appreciate the, the discussion that uh, Commissioner Aiken is starting on, on the policy area. Uh, just to provide some context, 20% um, is awesome. Like very few projects can come in at 20%. And this one has met it, which is a high bar we've set for the city. So uh, though, you know, from my perspective, yes, we need more. Um, it's worth acknowledging that they have come in at a very high bar, which many projects in the area don't meet. So um, it is a relief to see a project that's starting at, at uh, what we've asked of them. So that's that's good. It, it is also interesting to hear that you've been able to add another unit. Uh, so that's something to acknowledge as well. And I, for one, appreciate the applicant um, taking that approach and would love to see more applicants do that. I think that's what the city is asking of, of people. So um, yeah, that's that's my thought on the matter. Um, in general, I appreciate the proposal and I'm definitely excited. I think that the ARB is going to have some comments on on this and it may look different when we when we get it back. Um, but one thing to uh, to celebrate in this initial design is that we have natural light um, and patios in. Is it all the units? Was it nearly all or all? Yeah, it's, yeah. So that's something to just clarify in the presentation because we heard two different things. But uh, only if you want us to look at it next time. But I'm just celebrating that it's nearly all or all. Let's start there for now. Um, but the the idea of being able to have that much natural light and access to the outdoor fresh air is really important. And um, I want to highlight that as something that I like. So I'm going to kind of just roll through a few things that I like and like uh, some of the others here, just highlight some questions that still remain. So um, I also appreciate we have a sample of your textures here and colors, uh, and I think they're very exciting. I like the ideas that you've uh, put forth in your design, especially making it look more homey and town homey than uh, you know, giant block house, for example, right? You've, you've taken the time to do that, and that's very nice. Um, like Vice Chair Chang, I really do hope we find a way to keep that greenery on the street front. This area, um, for the benefit of anybody listening who might not be familiar with this street, we has gone through a lot of changes that, um, especially on the street side landscaping over the last decade or so, where we've, we've lost a lot of trees, we replaced some trees, but it's a landscaping and, and we know we've got some more work coming up on that road. So uh, it's really nice to see that you're keeping that greenery in mind because it does make it look homier. So thank you for that. Um, regarding the location um, and, and I, I sort of anticipate that maybe we'll see more development on the Mountain View side that we might find they want to pursue homes there. I'm not exactly sure. And we, it's not relevant to our discussion, but um, I think in general, that whole area that's industrial now may change more towards residential in the future and being able to cooperate with the neighboring properties is a nice precedent to set. So I appreciate that as well. Um, I think Vice Chair Chang mentioned this, but just to acknowledge it, 
that you have a mix of sizes here. Some of the proper, some of the proposals we've seen have been a lot more smaller properties. And I see you've got some family sized units here and that makes me very happy. Um, there will be likely more discussions in the future. Um, if, as we see more residential units in the area around schools and safe crossings and things like that. So we hope you as owners will participate in those conversations about how we can have safe crossings and less congestion. Um, the underground parking garage, like Commissioner Aiken, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful <laughs> that it's all gonna work out, but we have seen a few of these um, be problematic. So, you know, contingency plans galore for the parking situation. Um, and then I uh, just want to echo the concerns that uh, Vice Chair Chang mentioned about the trees. Uh, she's right. That is exactly <laughs> the open space uh, dearth in the area is exactly why I asked the questions about the roof. Um, and I understand now why it's not practical in this scenario because of the, the egress. So thanks for explaining that. But I do hope you can brainstorm with the ARB about any reasonable way uh, to consider that that wouldn't exacerbate your cost or height issues. Uh, although I realize that's a bit much of an ask. So. Um, in general, I think there's a lot to, to celebrate in this proposal. I'm very glad to, to be reviewing it and uh, not as uh, apprehensive as some of the proposals we've seen. So I can, I can tell that you've put a lot of care into addressing the needs of our community and um, appreciate you bringing it forward. So that's my comments. Thank you. Commissioner Chang. Hi. <laughs> I too was really pleased when I looked at the size of the units and the affordability table once I created it because I didn't see it <laughs> on my own. Um, and really, really pleased to see that there were seven units set aside for very low income, so 30 to 50% of AMI, and then another five two bedrooms for 50 to 80% of AMI. So that is fantastic. And then um, pleased to see that there are two three bedrooms, so family size units uh, at 80 to 120, and another two two bedrooms at 80 to 120. So that's, and when I, I always do this analysis where I look at what income that actually represents and whether that would actually mean housing for teachers or you know is it is it truly affordable and those would truly be affordable so I mean, it would still be difficult but it's within reach and so i was really pleased to see that um i was also pleased to see that the bike storage was on the ground floor because in the garage is just, you know, unless it's there's good elevator access and everything, it's not really feasible for what looks like fam you know, families are going to be here and likely kids riding bikes. So really glad to see that. Um, also glad that when I kind of asked the questions about the patio encroachment and the rear setback, that it's a very slight encroachment because as Commissioner Templeton mentioned, I do foresee that in the future it's likely that on the Menlo, uh, Menlo Park now you've got me saying Menlo Park but on the Mountain View side that there's going to be residential development there as well and so I would it sounds like there's going to be a decent amount of space um, if if on the rear side that there's also a patio uh, or a balcony um, that, that you know it won't be balcony to balcony five feet apart so I think that's looking good there um and I think that this location is the right place for some added height because it's not overshadowing um, much lower residential uh, neighbors. So I think that that's, that's, that's really important. Um, the things that make me a little bit nervous are this area of Palo Alto is a bit of a urban heat island. So as you move into the southern part of Palo Alto, 
it's noticeably warmer than the northern part of Palo Alto because the trees are younger and smaller and it is noticeably warmer. And if you get towards San Antonio, it is really hot. So if you kind of get onto the other side of San Antonio, onto the Mountain View side, if you've gone to Costco in the summer, it's roasting. Um, it's really hot because there are no trees or very few. And, they're in the, and so I don't know what we do about that, but um, I think this is like a larger question and a larger planning question for us as a city. Um, it, I, I, I'm not quite sure how we solve this problem because if we want this density, I don't see where we necessarily put the trees, but I wanna see if there's any way to creatively make it cooler. <laughs> Um, so I, I didn't look at the roofing materials and, you know, green roofs, school roofs, what you can do there. Um, but we want to make sure that this part of Palo Alto and Mountain View isn't roasting hot and a fundamentally different place to live, um, for all the many people who are going to be living here. Um, and another concern I have is, um, if we put a, so while it's within walking distance of Costco, I don't think anybody can realistically walk with a Costco size uh, toilet paper <laughs> bale. So really you need at minimum a bicycle, but that's also difficult. Um, so what I'm saying is that this is a transportation, it's, it's difficult on San Antonio. Transportation is difficult. And um, as I think about school age kids trying to cross over to get, this is a PAUSD, uh, people living here would be going to PA, PAUSD. And as I think about them trying to get to where our schools are, they'd have to cross San Antonio. Ideally, we're going to have bike lanes there at some point. We as a city need to plan to have bike lanes there. And one of my concerns would be that if our loading zones, you know, for trash, for FedEx delivery are in the bike lane, if we eventually have a bike lane there, that could present a real problem. Um, so I worry a little about like long term circulation impacts for this property, as well as every single other property that may be developed there. Um, and then finally, while I think that affordability is amazing, if I sit there and actually do the math, I, this is, you know, we're already getting a lot, but my understanding is that when we take, say, something like 20% affordability, or in this case, 21%, we're supposed to evenly divide the number of units. Um, so if there's... 15 three bedroom units. Our goal usually is then to have 20% of those three bedroom units affordable. Is that correct, staff? Yes. Um, I need a second to see what the uh, comments were. And I understand, that. though, that we are going for deeper affordability here. So maybe there's some negotiation there. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. Um, in our review, we determined that they do need to change one of the one bedroom units to a three bedroom unit to meet the affordability okay. mix. Great, because that was exactly my concern too, is that there's 15 three bedroom units. So then doing the math, one more three bedroom unit should be affordable. Um, so yeah, great, thank you. Um, Commissioner Rechtal? I have a couple more questions here. Uh, I'm looking at L1 and up near the driveway, there's drivable grass. Can you explain the reason? Uh, can the applicant explain the reason for the drivable grass near the driveway? So I believe you're talking to the area that is immediately to the south of the driveway? Correct. Yeah. Um, so that's part of our uh, stormwater program. So inside the perimeter of the garage, there's no chance for us to infiltrate the ground. Since we're required to have a plaza in front of the building, a portion of it is, is designated as permeable so that that water can reach the soil. Okay. So it's not so much that you're adding drivability to grass, but you're adding grass to a, a patio or it's, plaza. 
It's really a way of doing a permeable plaza element, yes. Okay. I have also a question about the stacker. How reliable are stackers? I don't have a feel about that. Is it you know, they break down once a year, once a month? What? No, I think the track record is uh, the depending on the brand that you buy. They're actually f uh, fairly simple devices. They really comprise a motor and a cable that lifts, uh, and it seems really implausible because cars are heavy. But in fact, they're not that heavy compared to other uh, other things. So the more reliable uh, lift systems that we've seen, there may be a maintenance call every couple of years. And, okay. uh, and usually if they're worth their salt, they have uh, on-call maintenance crews so that they're there in a couple hours. Can you, you can imagine if your car is stuck. Yes. Um, that gets people very uh, excited. And so um, we have definitely seen that the ones that are still in business like uh, for instance, Klaus is one of the more uh, popular brands. It is precisely because their devices are so reliable. And uh, you know, I would, I would liken it to like a passenger elevator. You don't want that thing to be breaking down. You want it to be reliable all the time. The technology is somewhat similar. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then um, during the council, the discussion the pre-screen one of the council members asked about solar panels on the roof yes uh, did you investigate that at all oh you know i contemplated bringing the roof plan because at the end of the day the roof is actually packed with things and so this somewhat addresses the why is there no roof tech as well uh the new building code the new cal green code is much stricter about how much solar and when you install it. Um, and so we have large areas of solar uh, designated and then all of our mechanical equipment will live up there as well. Uh, we're using a very efficient system, a variable refrigerant flow, which is uh, highly efficient. It allows you to do multitasking with the energy. For instance, you can heat water with it as well as cool the building. And then uh, they can do double duty. They can work during the winter and the summer. So they both heat and cool all in the effort to make an all electric building, which is another one of our goals. Um, the, the, uh, I can't remember if Palo Alto is one of the municipalities that's already passed the no gas rule, but we're essentially, uh, designing all of our buildings to be hooked up to the grid because of how much green it's getting. And uh, so all the appliance packages, all the heat pumps, all the water heaters are electric water heaters. All of that is being incorporated. Okay, so would you be able to add solar panels on the roof? Yes, That's yeah, we have plenty, plenty of space for that. Okay, but it's not in the baseline design? You know, uh, the baseline I believe is 15% of the roof surface. When you start looking at things like the maintenance areas, the mechanical, the elevator overruns, you're already starting to, get, and then the clearances that you need around the uh, solar panels and the equipment. Uh, when I looked at the roof plan earlier, it's packed. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, could we probably get more solar panels in? I believe that we could. So you will have 15% of the roof covered by solar panels? Um, I think that's the code minimum. I'll have to double check okay. the number. See, it's 15 or 20. Okay, that, that is good. But is there any reason you couldn't put solar panels raised above the mechanical equipment? No, you can. Um, it's just a question of efficacy, you know, because uh, uh, some of the mechanical equipment, you have to raise it quite a bit because there's a plume of hot air coming out of it, uh, which the panels don't like. Um, but uh, if we're really trying to uh, shove as many beans as possible in the bag, we can look at all kinds of possibilities. So is there anything structurally or electrically that would prevent this? So let's say five years down the road, you wanted to add it. Have you painted yourself no. in the corner or you have the flexibility to add it? No, as it turns out, the, the primary uh, concern with solar panel installation is penetrating the roof membrane just because it leaks. But um, in terms of their load, they're, they're relatively light compared to most other, uh, like I think the roof even has to have a live load capability that can handle that dead load. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, that's all I have for you. Thank you. Yeah. I have a question for staff. I, I also am concerned about the greenery. We are making good use of this lot, but that also means there's no room for greenery. Uh, what are the restrictions for planting in that front setback area? Could you add bushes? Could you add some type of greenery up front? 
or can you not plant anything? Yeah, uh, there's a there's allowance for um, vegetation. I think when it gets to be problematic is when there's trees that you know start to send roots. If you're putting basements and such nearby, you know you have to be careful about all that. Um, okay. And of course, anything that's put into an easement, which this isn't, but you know would be cautionary. Okay. okay. And then you also mentioned the cost. There was an in lieu fee if they weren't able to plant all the trees on site. Uh, what is the cost of that in lieu fee? Do you have a rough number? I can look that up. Um, it's something that would be in the tree technical manual, it's part of the urban forestry department regulations um, rather than planning. So I'm less familiar with where to go looking for it. Okay, I don't think we need to know it now, but next time it comes back, I would like to know how much how much that costs because that's a policy issue also. If that price is too low, then we're really encouraging people not to plant trees. But Okay, uh, I'll hold my comments and let everyone else have a shot at first. Commissioner Liu. Well, yeah, I'll just make some quick comments. I really like the project for all the reasons other people have mentioned, and just I hope we can build housing there soon. Um, a few specific comments. I do like the size, actually, and personally, I wouldn't mind more housing, though that might be a fringe position. I also like that there's not too much parking. Um, and on the point about potential issues with underground parking, I would personally much rather remove parking than have a podium at street level and really just dis detract from the street. A um, couple of points to note, I quadruple, quintuple the point on uh, greenery and I live above the parking garage. We have small maple trees, yucca trees, jasmine bushes, a variety of plants. Maybe I should be worried, um, but uh, I, yeah, I think reconsideration of the landscaping would be great, especially in the area out front where there are a lot of low lying shrubs. We could add something that feels and looks more green. Um, yeah, and the last point is I don't want to get stuck on retail since I realize that could be a big change, but any consideration, um, of retail would make a huge difference in the long run for the neighborhood. Um, it really needs more third spaces and retail that's not giant big box stores or chains. Okay, I don't see any other lights, so I'll make a few comments. And I just wanna thank the applicant and our staff for their presentations and for bringing this housing project to us, to the applicant. And there's a lot of good in that, but I have um, some questions and problems. One thing, and some of this is for staff and our process and some is more for the applicant. But um, one thing is I think all the bike um, storage is in the bike room in front, 76 spots. That um, strikes me, and I don't, I didn't see, but maybe there's other private storage area for the units, but I didn't see it in the plan. And that strikes me is a very limiting number of bicycles, especially since you're good enough to provide family size units here. I don't know where anyone else would put their bicycles. You could have three or four kids in a three bedroom, um, apartment and, um, and we want people to bike. And um, so that seems limited to me. Also, um, there's only about half of the parking spots have electric chargers. I'm not sure if they can be added later or if they can't be put in where stackers are, but that seems very problematic also, especially since the city wants new multifamily buildings to be um, 100 percent electric. Um, and while it's 
not taking away from all the other stuff being electric. It's not providing that option for all the residents. And I don't know how you would decide who got to use the EV spots and who didn't. And that just sounds complicated to me. Um, I think to some of my colleagues, um, concerns about trees and landscaping, I would agree. And in general, I'm not at all convinced that one shared um, open space area is adequate for a building this size, especially given that there will be families here with children who have nothing they can walk to, nowhere they can walk to play. And I note that for two sides of the shared open space um, have uh, the patios, private patios um, abutting them. Um, so that seems kind of strange to me, but it seems like um, the outdoor open space is very limited where the, in a neighborhood where there are few options. I would have been very interested in applicants wanting to provide usable retail for residents on the ground floors we develop in this area only because there is actually not much that's walkable in any practical way. And if everybody did it, it would create a new environment of walkability and usability. But if nobody does it and we don't require it, it's just gonna be a dead zone in that regard. Um, let's see. I am very troubled by using um, the public right of way for, that is for parking um, on, on the street for loading and garbage because I think well, first of all, I think it can be very awkward given the traffic on the street. Garbage trucks are really wide and there's a lot of traffic and gridlock in rush hour on the street. San Antonio uh, onto 101 there is a, is a problem on ramp that we've been trying to get fixed for years because it's very old fashioned and backs up and doesn't work well. People already living on San Antonio and there's another residential um, use on San Antonio Altair, just a little further closer to 101, already experienced a lot of difficulty with the traffic there. Um, and then I, for one, I have to say, um, while we all appreciate what you've brought here today, I was, um, I'm disappointed that the extension of the hip to this area and the um, development standards um, and th that that offered was not enough and that now you want even more than 70, 788, which is uh, hasn't been built, but has been entitled. And I'm worried that as we go through developments in this area, each one will want more based on the fact that the applicant before them would want more. And that's certainly not an applicant issue. That is a planning issue and a policy decision issue for ultimately the council. Um, some of my questions have already been answered. Um, I, I'm very concerned that in this area with its underlying zone, zoning of CS and the extension in for nine and a half acres or 18 parcels, I think it was, to extend the hip um, to get housing to change from what light industrial to housing that we don't have, we haven't thought about extending any um, extra privacy and daylight plane protections to this area because as you know, as buildings get bigger than the one next to them, that's gonna become an issue. Um, I find a five foot side setback to be unreasonably small. And I think the, the project would be more successful with more open space around it. I worry that with the loading and I worry about the future for our city of finding a way to put safe uh, class four, I think is the best class bike lane, even with the 24 uh, special setback being kept because are you really gonna want, I mean, both bike lanes might need to be developed on one side of San Antonio. I'm not sure. Um, nobody's looked at it in detail yet, but would you really, it makes the building entrance um, 
unusable except from accessing inside the garage if the bike lane is heavily used. And it also makes the building right on a bike lane. So I think these buildings would be more successful if they had a more standard um, uh, residential multifamily setback, which I believe is much bigger, but I can't remember what that is right now than, than 24 feet. Um, but like I said, that's that's a that's a city and policy and staff question. It's not a, for the applicant. Um, but I guess I'm not sadly as excited as some of my colleagues are about this. Um, as I see this project specifically, and it's not because there's a problem with the project, but it was the same issue with the one previously that got. Um, entitled here, and that is that we are entitling these projects that will limit what we can do to widen um, and make San Antonio safer and more accessible for bikes and pedestrians. And I don't think that's what we want to do. So um, let me see. I do have another light so I can stop speaking and I'll let Commissioner Rechtal speak. Yeah, I just want to give my two cents. Uh, yeah, uh, this is a big project and big is good and that it's 76 units and that's 76 families out of a house. So that's really good. And that's why I'm supportive of this. Uh, there are same things about it that give me a pause. Um, we are building right up, you know, the setbacks are tiny. There's no room for trees or greenery. Um, we, you know, for the look of it, the massing will be large. And you've done a good job of breaking it up and hopefully the ARB can help you with that. Uh, but that is concern that we have five feet on the side and 10 feet on 78. Those two buildings are gonna be 15 feet apart. That's gonna be tight. But again, we're adding a lot of units and that's a plus for this. Um, it also is near the East Bay Shore Job Center. Google is adding a lot of, a lot of jobs and the units that we put over there means that people have a short commute. They can bike or even walk to their jobs. And so that's a good thing. Um, I like the affordability. I like the, this true affordability. It's just not a bunch of micro units that they've discounted. They're re these are real units that are affordable. And I also like the fact that there are units that are sized for families. That's a really good thing. Um, they're the two biggest complaints I have aren't on the applicants on us. It's so we don't have any existing bike lanes and we have no nearby parks. When you look at this type of dense housing, there's no backyard here. There's no place that you can throw a ball with your kid. That has to be done in a park now, and we have no nearby parks. And so we really do have to take it seriously. This is not the only high density area, high density development that we're gonna have in this area. We need to be adding parks nearby because if, especially with these family sized units, they're gonna be families that need outdoor activities. So, but overall, even with all those bad things, I think this is a good good design and I hope that we can make it work. Thank you. I'm gonna call on um, Commissioner Templeton in one second, but I'm also gonna note that the housing element um, had, the housing element has maximum and realistic anticipated numbers of units, which for this site was 40 and 27 anticipated. And we're getting a lot more than that, which is great, but we don't need every single site that gets developed be, to be that, to be three times or two times or whatever it is, the housing element um, to the detriment of how the people living in this new neighborhood, residential neighborhood are gonna experience life, which could be, I think um, Commissioner Chang said it could, it was in terms of heat islands, but could be very different than the way other people in Palo Alto experience life, even in multifamily dwellings. Um, multifamily buildings. So I just want to keep in, and once again, that is not directed at the applicant, that is more directed at us and what we're doing in the city and what we're, um, you know, uh, how we're communicating with applicants. So I wanted to add that for, uh, because I forgot to say it. And then um, I will uh, move on to Commissioner Templeton. I appreciate the chair's comments. Uh, I. I echo the need for dealing with San Antonio and this area has suffered from serious planning and transportation neglect uh, for decades. Um, I remember 
talking about uh, improving the flow, which the chair mentioned as well over in this area, which requires coordination and cooperation with Mountain View when we were improving that intersection of Charleston at San Antonio um, back when I first joined the commission. This was a long time ago. And the feedback we heard from staff at that time was that's Mountain View. But as we start developing this corridor and adding more people, it's, it's not, it's not, it, if it's not industrial, we're talking a lot, hundreds of more people, maybe if we're lucky, thousands of more people will be housed in this area that we have used for industrial purposes uh, in the past. So I would ask uh, staff when you come back, just to let us know what kind of um, planning is happening for the flow, the transportation part, um, the cooperation part with the neighboring cities and things like that. I think that will really help us also to address the questions because how, how do we evaluate this, um, this project in the context of what it's going, what this area is going to change into, right? It's not like it used to be, um, we, we need to use it for something else now. So uh, if there's anything we can do as a commission to encourage um, more, more focus there, we'd love to, especially the biking. Um, so what we talked about at that time, maybe five years ago, was a bike path, uh, which we've got now down Charleston to San Antonio, but now we need to be able to go either way on um, San Antonio Road, especially if we're expecting people who will reside in these properties to work in the Bayshore office parks. So um, getting the bikes over 101 is terrifying. I've done it. I learned my lesson. <laughs> it's really scary. Um, so, you know, we do have the uh, option for what is it, Fab the Fabian um, crossing, but that's also about a mile detour just throwing that out there anyway so um regarding the the trash on the street i don't know is that something the arb will address or is that something you want us to address because i think i think we got opinions on it we all want to share it uh i will share mine i put my trash on the street my street isn't as busy as san antonio road it's really an apples to oranges <laughs> comparison, but I understand why that's the proposal. That's where our services offer to pick up the trash, right? Like, um, so we need to figure out how to meet the needs of our utilities while meeting the needs of the people that are using this major, major road. So, um, I think that was a good point that to everybody brought up, but I, I'm not against it. I'm just saying that needs to be th thought through. And it sounds like that's on the docket for you guys anyway. That's something you're still looking at. Yeah, that would fit nicely into the, you know, what the ARB considers when it looks at the findings for functionality. Look at that. The ARB is going to handle it. <laughs> well, and as I mentioned earlier, the zero waste department has not um, approved the current arrangement yet. So it is still under discussion. So I think just if I'm phrasing correctly, what, what sentiment you're hearing from this body as input to that conversation is don't mess up the flow of traffic. <laughs> like do what you gotta do, but let's try to not cause a distraction there. And leave room for future protected bike lanes. Yes, I think the whole protected bike lane discussion is huge and bigger and needs more attention. So um, if, is that something we wanna, it's, it's not agendized. How do we, other than this commentary, how do we let you know we really want to talk about that? I think. Well, as the PTC liaison, I can certainly um, let transportation know if they're not still on the call. Um, <laughs> we, we can have future sessions. We sessions. love them. We yeah. always want them here, and yeah. we always want to talk about this stuff. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I think it's 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 actually going to become urgent and problematic if we don't address it ahead of time. Right. So uh, anyway, are we, do you want a motion? Um, I don't know that we need a motion, even though it's an action item I was going to ask Steph, because this was really uh, a first step. It's yeah. going to come back 
to us for a recommendation to council up or down and with conditions or whatever we come up with. Do you want a motion that contains all these various thoughts or are you good? And Albert, I see that Albert Yang is here to give us advice. Uh, so <clears throat> I'll just say that we'll, we'd like at least uh, a motion uh, moving it forward to the ARB. Okay, that's all right. So we need a motion to move it towards ARB with all our comments. I would be happy to make that motion to move it forward to ARB with all our comments. Thank you. And is that okay for everybody or does anybody have any more comments before we move to the motion? No? Okay. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. So we just need to vote on that then. Uh, Commissioner Aiken? Yes. Vice Chair Chang? Yes. Commissioner Liu? Yes. Commissioner Rectal? Yes. Chair Suma? Yes. Commissioner Templeton? Yes. Motion carries 6 0. Thank you very much. Would my colleagues like to take a short break before the next item? Yes. Yes. Okay. We will uh, uh, take a short break for seven minutes. Thank you very much.
And we will move on to our next item, which is um, about the traffic calming uh, issues in Crescent Park. So I believe the first uh, thing we should do is get a staff report. Uh, good evening. Uh, I can start whenever you're ready. Oh, here. We are ready. Sure. Good evening, Honorable Chair and Commission members. Ripan Bhatia, Senior Engineer with the Office of Transportation. Uh, tonight before you, we are here to seek uh, PTC's review in the proceeding forward with the traffic calming project in Crescent Park neighborhood. Um, a brief background, the residents of uh, Crescent Park neighborhood expressed their concerns about the cut traffic congestion and speeding that led to the development of a pilot program for traffic calming with improvements at various locations. Uh, PDC approved the pilot project in September of 2020, uh, and that later that year in uh, uh, 2020, Council granted the approval to proceed forward with a pilot program. Uh, staff uh, designed and constructed the improvements in summer of 2021. Uh, staff conducted the post-installation survey of the traffic conditions uh, and sought feedback from the neighborhood community in fall of 2022 a year after the implementation, and collected data that revealed uh, improvements in the traffic conditions. Uh, project also garnered uh, support from this community to proceed with the permanent improvements. Uh, so therefore, staff is now requesting PTC to review and support the review in approval of recommending uh, to proceed with the design for permanent uh, improvements to the city council. Uh, I'll now hand it off to Chirag Panchal, who has been managing this project and will share the additional details of the project. Chirag. Thank you, Ripan. Uh, my name is Chirag Panchal, Associate Transportation Engineer with the Office of Transportation. Uh, let me share the screen, the slides. Uh, Can you see the slides? Yes. Yes. Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, this is this is the presentation about traffic coming project Crescent Park neighborhood staff recommends that the planning and transportation commission reviews and recommends to the city council for approval of the permanent installation of the traffic coming pilot project in the Crescent Park neighborhood. Uh, project information: the initial goal for this project was to improve the safety and quality of life, minimize the travel speed during on and off peak hours, uh, minimize the cut through traffic during the peak hours in the Crescent Park neighborhood area. Uh, this slide shows uh, the brief uh, area for the Crescent Park project. It's a bit bigger than that, but this is more of a location focus. That's why I took the snapshot of this. Uh, this is the traffic calming measures that uh, uh, consultants and the staff came up with for the traffic calming. And it's uh, already in uh, place right now as a pilot project. The first one as we are seeing here is by the East Crescent Drive and Southwood Drive. This is the three-way stop signs uh, at the Southwood and East Crescent Drive curb extension improvement. An oval shaped traffic circle, which I'm sure if uh, you have driven by uh, at this location, you might have seen this pilot oval shaped uh, by the Hamilton Avenue Center Drive and Southwood Drive. The third location is at the West Crescent Drive uh, and the University Drive, uh, 50 foot protected bikeway. There are currently four to five uh, bollards uh, that protects the bikers on the University Avenue. Location number one, uh, this is the Southwood Drive and East, East Crescent Drive. This is the uh, traffic calming, um, uh, uh, traffic calming uh, project that uh, at this location that uh, uh, staff and consultant came up with uh, to reduce the speed and cut through traffic. Uh, this is as we can see it's a temporary. Uh, uh, the location is been placed right now. Um, the second location is uh, the just to give you the picture and the idea of the oval shaped and how it's looked like if no one has seen or no one has driven by. Uh, this is the oval shaped circle and uh, it's uh, been effectively uh, working. I have driven a couple of times uh, over there and then also observed after the post pilot uh, project installations uh, of this oval shaped. 
Location number three is uh, University Avenue and West Crescent Drive. Here we can uh, see there are four bollards here that protecting the bikers uh, biking on the University Avenue, especially during the peak PM peak hours. Uh, what's happening over here is that a uh, lot of cut through traffic was uh, going uh, to the West Crescent Drive, making a right turn and jamming into the into this uh, bike lane, and also for bicycles to move around. Before I go into the slides, I want to uh, talk about that uh, uh, the average volume, the we, the staff collected the pre-pilot and post-pilot data and average volume on Hamilton Avenue reduced by approximately 35%. University Avenue reduced by 6%. Average volume on East Crescent Drive and Center reduced by about 23%. And average speed on center drive reduced by about 11%. And keep in mind, these are the average. Uh, we have uh, the data log uh, uh, presented by the consultant as well. Uh, moving forward to this side, uh, we also, after we saw the pre and post pilot data collection and we saw the improvement, uh, the staff thought it is necessary to ask uh, uh, to get a vote from the, from the residents since uh, uh, that vote, their vote matters and uh, that's their neighborhood. So uh, location one, we collected the, the vote for as an overall neighborhood as well as the uh, the area, the focused area neighborhood as well. So Southwood Drive and East Crescent Drive, which was the location number one, uh, curb extension and stop sign, 74% uh, said yes, 26% 20, uh, said no. On location number two, Hamilton Avenue, Southwood Drive and Central Drive, oval shaped circle, 78%. Uh, said yes and 22% no. So majority of the residents were in the favor of converting these temporary improvements to permanent improvements uh, at these uh, locations in this Crescent Park neighborhood. And uh, I want to reiterate that uh, the the design that we are we are seeing here it's it's temporary. It's not aesthetically pleasing looking right now because we are in the pilot project uh, phase right now. As a next step for this uh, project um, will be, the staff will be seeking uh, the council appro approval for permanent installation after the PTC recommends and based on the PTC uh, voting and approval, uh, staff will also initiate the design for permanent improvements if everything uh, after the city council's approval. Uh, during that period of time, staff will re outreach, reach out to the community and seek feedback on the planning and designing. And that's where the residents will be able to vote and have their uh, say on the on the design and uh, as, uh, how the how the traffic coming is pleasing and what they need to what the, the staff or the city needs to include in order to fulfill their any any questions or any concern they have. Um, in the meantime, uh, the temporary improvements will remain in the in the place. The the staff do not think that it is uh, a time to take take out because we are moving in with the permanent installation if it's approved. Uh, and at this point, this concludes my presentations. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll take the questions. Thank you so much. And to wrap up, I just want to also add to the fact that, uh, yeah, certainly in neighborhood feedback and fronting property owners uh, will be involved as we design these improvements when we do the, uh, the if it goes through the uh, permanent uh, pro, uh, installation and also uh, this these features help not only in the traffic calming but also improve the safety uh, at these locations or in the neighborhood so uh, that concludes our staff report thank you thank you for that i see that i already have a light from um mr aiken who must have a question yeah i've got a couple um so the residents original concerns were about cut through traffic but uh, did we do an origin destination or some kind of zone study to get a big picture sense of where the traffic really is coming from and where it's going? Uh, Mr. Ponchal, I guess. Sure. Uh, so uh, I'm going back to the uh, the site, the, the slide where it shows the picture. Uh, so what's happening was that uh, the cut through traffic was majorly coming towards the Hamilton Avenue and going towards the West Crescent Drive or the Center Drive and or moving forward to, so these are the three main parallel streets. That's where the cut through traffic was uh, mainly and uh, mainly going through. And uh, believe it or not, at one point, uh, 
when I was driving from here, I was also, I also once used uh, the cut through traffic just to get the feel for it, how the traffic get congested and, and, and whatnot. Uh, the other also, the, the second point, I also want to make sure uh, to, to get it because I also work with, on the engineering side and the signal. So there's a signal on the woodland side is not, is the further signal is not owned by us. It's, you know, uh, I, I believe it's East Palo Alto. And, uh, and that coordination also causes the, the, the jam on the university PM peak. Uh, and this is before the COVID I'm talking about. So to answer your questions, these are the cut through uh, traffic that that uh, uh, that we saw as a major impact on the on the neighborhood. And, and Commissioner Aiken, if I might I add, uh, we looked at the pre-volume data on these locations and after uh, after uh, pilot project installation data. So we compared the pre and post. So we didn't do an origin destination, but we just did a comparison of pre pre and post uh, data on the volumes that were um, being. Uh, at this location. And we do understand that there may be some skew because of the COVID, uh, but there was overall degrees and that's what we noted. Thank you, Mr. Badia. You've moved exactly into my second question, which is the, the Fair and Peers report said, we can't separate the pandemic effects from the project effects. Um, so I was curious as to um, the confidence level you had in the traffic volume effects of the pilot. Yeah, and, and we cannot say with great certainty, uh, but we have noticed that on major freeways and major uh, facilities, the, the traffic has returned back to pre-pandemic level, though not in the local levels uh, at the same rates. Uh, so there is certain uh, level of uh, um, uh, so a certain level of uh, vo volumes that may be attributed to reduction due to the uh, pandemic. Uh, also noting that these features are not only um, uh, reducing the traffic, but also improving the safety. So if they are to use these intersections, they will be much more safer to use. Thank you. Those are the two questions I had. Mm, Commissioner Chang. Thank you. Um, do the staff have a sense of for the, you know, when when the residents were when the residents voted and there's you know, 20 odd percent who said no, they did not want the pilot turned into permanent uh, features. Why those 20 odd percent said no? Was there any um, open-ended feedback for that or has staff received comments? Sure, uh, I can answer the question. I am the one who uh, uh, piled up the comment. Uh, uh, the majority of the, uh, out of those 20 or 24 uh, percent, 22 percent and 26 percent, no, uh, the majority of them uh, said that uh, the, the aesthetically pleasing, it's not aesthetically pleasing. So they thought this is it, uh, there is nothing forward that the city is going to do with it. And that's what the majority of the comments that, that we received. Okay, thank you. And then what is the sample size here approximately? Like what's 100%, how many people? So we're looking at about 319 uh, uh, house, the, the residential household here. And the data is based on the 319 house, the, the residential household. Each household can only vote one. So you're saying that you got about 390 respondents? Yeah, about that. Okay, thank you. Um, I would uh, back to defer. Uh, I, would, I think uh, maybe Chirag, you can correct. The number of yeah. respondents were less than correct. that. Yeah, I, I want to clarify that the the uh, the so we the the zone the project boundary was 319 about that uh, uh, that size, but the the voting card we received was not not the 314. It's it's less than that. I don't know. I don't know the exact number on top of my head. I believe it was a little less than fifty percent, but yeah, it, there was good participation from the neighborhood. Okay, so at least a third participated. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Thank you, Commissioner Rectal. Yeah. So I'm, I'm looking at the traffic counts here. How much variability is there from one day to another, or from one week to another? So if I go on Tuesday and and count the traffic and come back the next Tuesday and count again, how much variability do you expect in that? Is there a rule of thumb that you have? Uh, 
correct me if I'm wrong, repent, but the way we count the traffic is uh, usually on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So that's when we have the uh, the highest traffic uh, count available. And then uh, 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 Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, depends on the project, depends on uh, uh, what area focus that we are doing. We take even highest of the Wednesday. So let's say there were 1700 cars on uh, vehicles on Thursday and then there were 2000 on uh, on Wednesday so we would go with 2000 but depends again on the project other projects we might take an average of all three days but to answer your question we would take uh, we would count on uh, we would place the data collection for Tuesday Wednesday Thursday okay uh, the the uh, the uh, sorry to answer your question is from one week to another week uh, uh, the traffic does not differ that much uh, from one week to another week, uh, from Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and the next week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. But I do wanna, hope, I do wanna confirm that uh, uh, the the staff takes the data when the school is in session, when uh, the weather is is good. Uh, if there is something off, then we would cancel the data and uh, try to collect the data when when it's clear weather everything runs uh, perfectly as as normal condition. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, or if you want to add this to this data collection or to this question. Uh, you know, you, uh, you summarized pretty good, uh, but uh, Commissioner uh, uh, Rectal, uh, to answer your question, generally a peak day, uh, uh, midweek is a representative of a, a, a regular day in general, and don't vary a lot. Within five five percent, usually. You think okay, plus five percent. So when we're my concern is that we have two samples here, and how much of it is causation, how much is just randomness, and are we trying to look at randomness and trying to look at trends, form trends from randomness? Okay, thank you. Um, I have a couple questions. One is, um, so was the University Avenue? Maybe I missed something. Was that also the bollards to protect the bike lane? Was that also somehow voted on by neighbors? No, um, we excluded that from the voting process since those are more like a actual traffic calming device, uh, traffic uh, control devices. Uh, and also, they uh, we they they were we were intending on keeping that moving forward uh, with or without traffic calming uh, because they have been um, a safety measure as well. Okay, thank you for that. And then, is the plan when they're made permanent permanent with two and three, the rubber curb and the oval area um, to be landscaped? So uh, we would uh, um, seek input from the residents uh, and community in in moving forward with the uh, with the design of those improvements. Generally, we would like to have some kind of aesthetically pleasing elements uh, to match with the community, um, uh, you know, uh, surroundings and environment. Um, and uh, depending upon the budget and availability, we will balance those needs. Okay. So. Um... I think they would be much more successful and safe, the oval especially. But I think devices like that in the street are safer and more pleasing to look at when they're landscaped. So that would make them successful for me. And then um, asking about something that um, um, Commissioner Aiken asked about, given the um, inability to separate the pandemic effect from um, non-pandemic times, would it be better to do another year or some period of time of the trial? Um, certainly we could extend um, the period of the pilot program, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, like I said, um, we can, we can, these are some of these safety features as well. So yeah, it's the, uh, certainly a feasibility, a feasible option. Okay. Um, all right, I don't see any other lights, so I'd like to go to members of the public. Do we have speakers, Ms. Dow? Yes, we have two in-person speakers. The first is James Grand. And do we have any out in Zoom land? Uh, oh yes, and one raised hand on Zoom. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you. Um, there's another Zoom uh, person, my daughter, uh, is uh, standing by and would like to also make some comments after I'm finished. And I live at 590 East Crescent Drive, which is uh, right at the at the berm 
uh, on you might put up location one just to, for for a for graphic. Uh, Next slide. Just a second. So, Rag, if you can pull the nine, slide, uh, page nine. The next location one yeah there you go that's, that's, see i i, <clears throat> I live uh, you know just beyond the berm i have to say that uh that, you know i'd hope you consider that for people who are directly affected like myself and others as opposed to further away that uh, people who quote have skin in the game if you will i think certainly should have you know a higher degree of consideration compared to people who just aren't affected that much and that said, um, I've lived at 590 East Crescent Drive for 43 years, and uh, I have an office that is just literally uh, looks right out on this uh, berm here. And uh, I, so I see a dynamic situation. I think you know, as, as good as the pictures are, that there's a static nature to them, as you would have to see. But uh, I'd, uh, and so I'd like to read a text that I prepared. And then my daughter, uh, who's also oversees a lot of my activities, that, that she'd like to speak afterwards. So with that, I'll, 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 I'll say as follows. Um, I'm opposed to the installation of the berm at this intersection of location one. My home looks out on a giant oblong berm. The city has temporarily installed at that intersection. I can speak with experience regarding the results of this attempt at traffic calming. There are three primary reasons why I am opposed to the berm. It's not safe. I see it on a dynamic basis as opposed to a static basis. And statistics are one thing, but on the other hand, just to observe the activity and, and, the, and the dynamics of the traffic, I see it all the time in real time. I can attest that the berm has created new and worse traffic issues, traffic safety issues at this intersection. Since this temporary berm was installed in August 2021, 20, excuse me. Since this temporary berm was installed in August 2021, I've regularly observed and have collected footage, video, if you're interested, of the effect that the berm has had on traffic. Drivers are not stopping at the new stops on East Crescent. I see it all the time. The signs are there, but the, the dynamic is they're not stopping. Instead, they're allowing, they're slowing only slightly, if at all, and are often swerving recklessly in an attempt to navigate around the barrier. On East Crescent, the berm makes the intersection too narrow for two cars to safely pass each other. I've witnessed near collisions repeatedly over the past year and a half. There are no other berms of this size in any residential neighborhood in Palo Alto. The transportation office admitted that there's no other intersection where a berm of this size has been implemented. The transportation office did not test out less, obstru less obtrusive measures of slowing traffic at this intersection, such as the installation of a stop sign without the berm. There's been no commitment from the transportation office regarding how this burn will be completed. Will it be filled with cement? Or will there be landscaping in the middle of it? The transportation office said that it might be filled with cement, which would be an unsightly blight on our beautiful tree-lined streets in Crescent Park. I don't understand how the planning commission can now vote to implement the berm without any thought as to what the final design of it will, of it will look like. Uh, well, Thank you for your uh, consideration, but I just have to say personally, not in my text here, but just living it, I hope I have credibility with you because I see it just daily. I see it have for the last couple of years and it is just a mess right now and uh, uh, period. So with that, I'll ask if, can we let my daughter speak on Zoom? Lisa Lawson, yeah. Okay, and could you give us your name? I didn't get it. Oh, that. sure. James Gerand, G-I-R-A-N-D. I, -I lived here for lived there for forty three years. I live alone, and uh, like to see my beautiful area remain beautiful. Okay, and and um, 
Mr. Duran's daughter is signed up, right? Yes, uh, okay. she's the person. Lisa yes, Lisa okay. Lawson is the one okay. who's on Zoom. You can unmute yourself. You have five minutes. Okay, thank you. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Great, thank you. So my name is Lisa Lawson. I am one of the property owners of 590 East Crescent, along with my father, who's lived there for 43 years. Uh, in addition to the safety issues raised by my father, Mr. Durand, I'm deeply concerned about the lack of thought given to less unsightly and extreme measures to slowing traffic at this intersection, intersection number one. The transportation office could have simply tried installing a stop sign at this intersection, which would have been in keeping with the look and feel of the neighborhood. Uh, they have offered statistics about the alleged slowing of the traffic along East Crescent, but as the commissioners have noticed, uh, there are no statistics regarding whether slowing could have been achieved with other less extreme measures, such as simply installing a stop sign. They've had the opportunity to measure the traffic calming effects of such a stop sign compared to this berm, but they didn't do that. Instead, they went ahead with a berm design that has never before been implemented in any residential neighborhood in Palo Alto. Initially, when they installed it, they actually installed it in, in an even larger format that blocked my father's, who's disabled, access to the uh, handicap um, ramp to his house uh, from, the, from the, the street to the sidewalk. And we had to have numerous meetings with them in order to get that changed. Uh, this leads me to my second issue, which is that the statistics, as the commissioners have noted, of the alleged traffic calming at this intersection are misleading. The city's post-berm statistics are based on measurements taken in the summer of 2022 compared to speeds measured in 2019. It's clear that the reductions in traffic volume and speed that the transportation office claims are the result of the berm were in fact the result of an unprecedented global pandemic and relatedly sharp reduction in the number of commercial tenants downtown and the fact that workers are increasingly working from home. If cut through traffic were truly reduced by the berm at East Crescent and Southwood, Southwood, one would expect that traffic would be diverted onto University Avenue. The city's statistics, however, do not support that theory. I am also deeply concerned about the transportation's office failure to provide any proposal as to how this berm will be completed and how it will be filled in, as Mr. Durand has noted. Uh, in listening to the commission's extensive discussion regarding the first item on tonight's agenda, it is clear that aesthetics of the city's planning projects are critical to assessing whether they should be approved. I do not understand why the transportation office has failed to offer a solution for how this project will actually be executed. Will this berm be a peninsula filled in with beautiful flowers and trees, or is it going to be a massive concrete structure? If it's going to be filled in with plants, we heard uh, Mr. Batia comment that uh, executing it will depend on budget. Well, if it's going to be filled in with plants, how will the city get water to it? It seems unlikely that they will be able to fill it in with plants and we'll, we'll be stuck with a giant cement berm at this beautiful intersection. I also want to note that the photo that Mr. Panchal showed of this intersection is warped and that it does not show the extent of the actual berm. Uh, the transportation office has bird's eye views of what exactly this berm shows or exactly how this berm is laid out. And it is significantly greater than how it appears in the photo that Mr. Sh uh, Panchel showed in his PowerPoint presentation. I also want to touch on one of the issues that Mr. Panchal, Mr. Batia spoke to, with, with, which is with regards to the vote. Uh, as they noted, the vote that they showed the statistics for included neighbors that don't even cross this intersection and therefore have no skin in the game, as my father would say, and have no real meaningful way of commenting on whether the traffic is improved or has become more dangerous. And I think that's all I have for now. Thank you. Very Um, if, if any of my colleagues have questions for you, we will let you know, but why don't you take a seat in the meantime? I believe we have another speaker. Yes, uh, last speaker is Greg Welch. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the staff of the Transportation Department. This has been a journey we've been on for, gosh, over four years at this point, approaching five years. Um, it was motivated by the observed conditions that the collective neighborhood was experiencing. It is not merely about 
the vehicular traffic, it is also about the pedestrian traffic. If you are in, tra in uh, Crescent Park in the morning, you see literally dozens and dozens and dozens of people out exercising, walking their dogs, et cetera. And the pedestrian situation, frankly, before these traffic calming measures were put in place, uh, were treacherous at times, particularly during the rush hour commute hours. A couple of comments. First of all, the uh, during the lengthy process that the uh, transportation uh, department ran, they did over three public workshops attended by as many as 120 people from the neighborhood, I think was the peak attendance. They looked at a whole variety of different measures that could be taken. They also educated us on the difference between traffic calming measures and traffic control measures. Stop signs are a traffic control measure. Berms, uh, roundabouts, um, curb extensions, these are all ones. And the big thing there was that these physically slow down traffic and do not require a policeman sitting there in a patrol car in order to enforce. Uh, with regard to the data collection, you know, we would all love to have perfect data. In fact, during the process, there was a big and long examination about what other sources of data we could get. There were companies out marketing data drawn off of cell phones. The more you look at those, they give the illusion of being perfect data. But when you plug in and drill in a little deeper, you realize all you're doing is sacrificing maybe um, one set of accuracy for another set of sample bias. Uh, there were also uh, budgetary concerns associated with buying that kind of data set. The trials that were used by the trans uh, transportation department are consistent with the accepted traffic planning norms. Let's talk about the impact of the pandemic. You know, we don't have an alternative universe where we can conduct a controlled experiment. So there was actually a lot of debate about should the experiment proceed. And the key thing is that part of what the debate looked at was not just overall volume, but the change in the pattern. Because the real issue previous to this trial was the fact that the main thoroughfare was actually not where most of the traffic was going. In fact, there was data that was in the Stanford did a very, very comprehensive study before this that showed that Hamilton was uh, carrying 35% more traffic at peak hours than university. And it was in part because what was happening is all that traffic was contributing to the backup on university because it was cutting through a residential neighborhood, rejoining university right up before the creek crossing and thereby backing university up. The key thing to bear in mind is, yes, the overall volume in our city has gone down, but it's not gone down equally. The reduction on university is only 6%. The reduction on Hamilton is more like 30%. So if it's not the traffic calming that contributed to that difference, what is it? So, as a resident, as somebody who walks their dog multiple times a day at morning and afternoon hours, I can say without reservation, I feel safer. Talking to neighbors, they feel safer, particularly at the five corner intersection. It, it was like a demolition derby there before. People would rush in. There was no sense of who is supposed to go next. How do I make the left? Now, are there shortcomings with the temporary designs? Yes, and even I think the, the, the transportation department would admit to those shortcomings because it was just a test. There were real limitations imposed upon what they could do under the budget of a trial and without reconfiguring the whole intersections. I think you also, if you ask them, if you said, do the intersections conform to anything approaching the standards for modern intersections that put pedestrian safety first, they would have to admit they don't. One of the reasons why there was a reference to the handicap access, it's because they're in the wrong place. They're actually not at the crosswalks. They, the handicap access dumps you into the middle of the intersection. So it would require and I expect that the transportation department, as it looks at a permanent installation, it's a well thought out, comprehensive, comprehensive redesign of these intersections so that they meet modern standards for pedestrian safety, as well as vehicular traffic flow. So I also 
share my neighbor's concerns about the aesthetics. We don't want this to look like something plunked down in a highway interchange in the middle of a residential neighborhood. But I think we can point to plenty of examples where the department has implemented very attractive landscaped traffic calming measures elsewhere in the city. And I have no reason to believe why this neighborhood would be any different. So I encourage you to at least allow this to progress to the next step, because I know that you're not sitting here today approving a final project because there's no design. This is just simply allow a process that has taken us five years to get to here with hundreds and hundreds of residents coming together and spending hours and hours and hours with city staff to just continue on a process to improve our neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Is that our final speaker? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, I guess I already have a um, light here from Commissioner Templeton. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, it's very interesting to see this, uh, how it played out, because I was, uh, this again was one of the, the projects from um, 2018, I think that, or thereabouts, that uh, was one of the first ones I worked on as well. And I think we were really hopeful for this project. And it sounds like some of the data um, supports that. And it's also interesting that some of the way data has been presented tonight doesn't tell the whole picture. So I really appreciate the people from the neighborhood sharing their thoughts. Um, I, I have brought up a picture uh, from Google Maps of what that berm looks like at point two and uh, that was shown earlier. And I wonder if one of the people from the transportation department can show, uh, it does give a very good sense of the size and scope of that area, uh, the size of the berm and, and why someone who uh, lives close to that and interfaces with it might be frustrated. Are you able to bring that up um, using street view? Um, for the benefit of my colleagues here, if you are able to bring that up, it's it's worth the wait. I think it'll be informative. I, I'll try to bring it up. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Can you proceed around the corner where you're looking at the back of the stop sign? Let me know when to stop. Yeah, you're uh, going the wrong way. Um, okay. Let me know when to stop. If you can see the back of the stop side that's within the berm, then you're looking at the right angle, the correct angle. So you need to proceed further down East Crescent and then rotate back towards the house. Sure. Yeah, so it's have to swing around to get in and out of that building. Um, it does go against um, adjacent to the, the, the walkway uh, and it's pretty large and is uh, visually distracting from the beauty of the landscaping of the home. So just wanted to, to validate that we're seeing that. Um, and also to echo some comments from the public that how can we really know if it's going to continue to be an, an eyesore like this until we have designs, until we okay designs. And so that's, that's the kind of crux of the question before us for this particular site. Um, I will say that the stories we heard back in 2018 were pretty compelling about why this was dangerous. You heard some echoes of that tonight. Um, now, are there things that can be improved? It sounds like we have some firsthand reports of uh, ineffectiveness of this stop sign that's controlling um, car traffic there and potentially that's an area for us to include in the study, right? So if we're able to specifically request that, 
not only you know, proceed with the planning and visualize what the designs might look like, but also to improve the effectiveness of that control. I think we could specify that in our motion tonight if we want to. Um, regarding the uh, irrigation, one of the things we've been trying to work on as a city is to irrigate um, less and plant native plants more so that you have something that's beautiful and hardy. So uh, I'd love to hear more thoughts on that from the my fellow commissioners. But I, I do feel like that's a solvable problem that we can make it beautiful for those that um, encounter this every day and, and see this intersection and experience it um, to make it beautiful and, and integrate into the neighborhood so that not only are cars actually stopping, but what they see when they're there uh, and pedestrians too is beautiful. So I think uh, all I can say is how much I appreciate people coming and sharing their thoughts because I think this is a, a yes and situation. We need to solve both problems. So that's my initial thoughts. Thanks. Commissioner Chang. Um, thank you to both the, or all three public comments. Really appreciate the additional color that that brings. And I, as a result, have some additional questions for staff. So do we have accident reports from at this intersection from beforehand and after? Because um, our first commenter mentioned seeing accidents here. Um, good evening, um, um, Commissioner Chang. Uh, to add to that, I, I just ran a report uh, with limited information that we have from uh, in our database after the, uh, after the installation. There was one uh, hit and run uh, with a, a damage. There was no damage uh, to any, uh, any entity there. So th there was only one collision that was uh, re reported um, uh, 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 since the installation. And so how long has this been installed again? And during the similar time frame beforehand, how many accidents were there? Let me run the one before. There was, let, let me get back to that one sure. uh, as I run the information, but uh, sure. I can see if we can answer. Other okay, questions. and then in the meantime, I'll ask um, a second question of Mr. Panchal. So can you review the process for what happens um, if this project moves forward in terms of the design process and then what are the steps or the review processes this goes through before actual implementation um, if it goes, if, if, we, if we move this project forward? Sure. Um, let me go back to... Uh, There's a slide I think that you had. Uh, yeah. So uh, at this point, uh, we don't have the in detail of uh, steps uh, inside of uh, of what will be the the steps. So, for example, uh, we'll seek first uh, is the council uh, approval for the permanent installation, and if that moves forward, then uh, the staff will initiate the design. Uh, for permanent improvements, and and at that phase, we'll work with the consultant uh, and the out, uh, outside parties to to uh, develop the scope of the of the permanent design, and also we will look into the budget uh, options as well. Uh, there are also some some uh, uh, information that we need to look at as an engineer regarding the irrigation pattern, uh, regarding uh, uh, how how the permanent design would work out uh, and it completely based on the design. Uh, for example, if we go look, if we go back uh, to this one, uh, so uh, we want to make sure that the debris doesn't fall inside uh, this curb if we were to make this uh, as a permanent. So let's assume for now, this is a permanent. So if the debris goes inside, which I draw by uh, there and then we could see it. So we would have to look into that as well to see uh, who is going to be responsible for it? So it's completely based on the design how we how we proceed uh, to move forward with that. So that is the 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 phase, the second phase that we are looking into it. Uh, then once the design phase is uh, 
60 or 75 percent based on how the staff feels uh, during the meeting, uh, we'll reach out to the community. So we, we would have a leeway of uh, going back to the consultants, say that, hey, we received this uh, few feedback from the residents. And then uh, what if we make these changes? What uh, if we make these changes? How would how would it look like? And what are the some concerns that, that we would uh, come across or what is some uh, uh, litigations that we have to take into account if we go move forward with the design? Again, we also want to focus on the uh, budget as well uh, to how much budget we have, uh, because we could literally go with the $2 million. We can make it $2 million project or we can make it half a million dollar project. Depends completely on the design phase. And, so uh, is it going to go, the, is it, so when city council makes the approval for permanent installation, does city council make a budget determination as well? And will it come back to any body for permanent approval or is that permanent, is the design approval ultimately made by staff? Let me take that question, um, uh, Commissioner Chang. Um, so our intent is to seek feedback from the community in, uh, in determining the, the elements that should be, that are kind of important to the community before we seek uh, the consultant uh, support for the uh, design efforts. And uh, we could have, uh, we could take certain, uh, 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 you know, we, we would have certain uh, uh, um, level of uh, in those, you know, those elements incorporated in the, in the concept plans in the de de development of the various, uh, uh, you know, options or alternatives, and uh, we will uh, uh, develop the budget accordingly and then seek feedback from planning and uh, PTC and our uh, city council as we move forward. And then also at the same time, make sure that our uh, community is involved in the process to, with the, for the outreach feedback and input as we make the, the, uh, make the design. Um, so at the initial level, at the time of the approval, after PTC approval, we would have a concept, uh, we would go to the council, get their approval to proceed forward with the design, seeking input from the residents, have a various concepts at, and then develop some cost estimates and then seek the direction. Okay, so it would come back to PTC is what you're saying. We will certainly be able to come back to PTC. Um, I guess the, my other question is, can we also study in this design process, can we study uh, the effectiveness of the stop sign or multiple ways to implement the stop sign itself? Uh, we can certainly look into it. The effectiveness of the stop sign um, uh, is generally difficult to because you would need um, more monitoring and we can look into the possibility of how we can study it. And if there are ways to do it, we'll certainly look into it and bring back uh, to, the, to the committee. Okay, thank you. I, I will say that one of the things that I am, as a comment, I am appreciative of the fact that there is a pilot in place um, because there are other situations elsewhere in the city where the city has not been responsive to safety concerns. And I'm really glad that in response to this neighborhood's uh, concerns, even though it's taken this long, and even though some of the solutions may not be optimal, that there actually is something being done. And um, I commend staff on, on that. I'm glad to see that there's temporary pilot berms put in place when we didn't do that for other things like Charleston and, and such. So um, that's it for right now. Thanks. And I'll, um, uh, I'll, I'll have an answer for your uh, uh, collision data question from before. So from 2016 to 2018, there were three collisions that were reported in this and that were reported in the sweaters. Um, so that's the data I'm looking at right now. And there was one uh, from- What was uh, the time frame again? From 2016 to 2018, there were three collisions at this location. So that is prior to the implementation. And since the implementation, there has been one and no other part, there was only one party involved, so. So that's an apples to apples time frame. Uh, no, it's not because we don't have any much time frame after the installation because it's, uh, we have only installed it in 2021. Yeah, I understand that. Okay, so it's not an apples to apples time frame, and it's also not apples to apples because there was a pandemic. Got it. Okay, sure. thanks. Commissioner Aiken. 
Um, I'm going to delve into uh, the policy issues again for a minute here, because this is something that's uh, near and dear to my heart. Um, the comp plan in goal T 4.2.1 requires us to evaluate traffic in residential areas periodically with the goal of um, prioritizing traffic calming projects. We're looking at one instance where we uh, finally got around to doing that today. But uh, as Vice Chair Chang said, there are plenty of instances of this elsewhere. And more importantly, there are instances of this that none of us know anything about because the measurements don't exist. So at the very least, we need baselines. Um, Taking a momentary deep dive into the data from this project, um, Lincoln Avenue between University and Hamilton had traffic 24 hours a day. Uh, the count was 1,480 vehicles, which is above the neighborhood traffic calming project threshold of 1,200. There's a problem already there that we're not doing anything about. Um, the average for all the neighborhood streets in this study was traffic 22.4 hours a day. So what's gradually happening is that our local streets and collectors are turning into de facto residential arterials. And we just don't know where it's happening and how quickly. So the policy uh, implications here uh, are that we need to do, we need to find a way and I understand the financial implications are difficult here. Um, we need to find a way to do what the comp plan requires and get those baselines so we can monitor what's going on because this is happening all over. We just don't know where and how seriously. Um, with respect to this project in particular, um, I'm extremely supportive uh, with the warning that this is just another round in a game of whack-a-mole. Uh, we'll be back with more issues in this general area um, before too long. Uh, so let's keep in mind that we have to take um, to have to take appropriate actions. But in the background, we should be doing better about finding a general solution. Thank you, Commissioner Rectal. Yeah, I was not on PTC at the time. Uh, so how did we choose these three locations and how did we choose these three techniques? For example, did, why did we not consider, or did we consider uh, speed bumps, for example, or other traffic calming measures? Commissioner Eckdell, sorry, I was also not part of the team originally. And um, this, I, my understanding is that uh, uh, there was a rigorous community input and outreach, as uh, Mr. Um, Greg Welch also pointed out in his uh, 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 comments, that there were several uh, community outreach meetings, uh, feedback and input, uh, support of the consultant in finding the different locations, and it narrowed down to the three locations uh, uh, for the final configuration that was uh, communities uh, uh, that would garner community support in moving forward. Okay, do you? So I, I'm, yeah. if, I, if I recall at the time, we had a, a transportation specialist on our a commission that contributed to the discussion as well. Um, so, it was uh, certainly it came from community conversation like the the reason it came in front of us was community conversations um like mr Bhatia said but also i think uh we were interested in trying things at the time because we had some ex additional expertise to consult but um that doesn't mean like it's been three years after we voted on it before it got implemented, the pandemic happened. Like, and we don't know for sure that we picked the right ones. Um, we, we do know that, that there are some improvements. We don't know if, if other variables would improve it more, improve it less, change it, change it in nature. Um, so I think that's, there's a lot of unknowns, but it is good that we did a rapid prototype 
like if you can call it rapid in five years. <laughs> Um, I, I was really shocked when I read the packet and realized it had been this many years after approving it before it was implemented. So like, just keep that in mind. Like there's a grain of salt with how we should be looking at it and what we should expect. Uh, so I hope that answers the yeah, question. That was helpful. Um, uh, uh, from, I'd like to add, uh, to Rickon's comment on this one, uh, Strictly uh, speaking from engineering point of perspective is that uh, uh, the reason why that uh, the consultants and the staff came up with this, uh, the, the recommendations and narrowed down to three is because the community raised the concerns and when community raised the concerns, those specific concerns are related to what traffic calming would be better choice. And that's how the recommendations and the reasons are made. And then the, the traffic calming are chosen after what the symptoms are as an overall in the neighborhood um, uh, from the first meeting. I was new at that time, so I, I don't have much of the background uh, as well, but uh, this was my two cents on the engineering side of, side of the point of perspective. Okay. I, I have a lot of concerns about this. I mean, overall, I think we have to address traffic here. I don't think there's the question is the best way to do it. And we can't think that we can get a perfect plan. You know, that don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. I'm not convinced that this is um, that we have data to support that this is the right thing to do right now. When I went out there, the the roundabout, I'm surprised that it wasn't a roundabout years ago. That seems like the right answer for that intersection. Uh, for this bulb out, I'm not convinced that that's. I can see that having a, a shallow corner, people could take that faster, but I'm surprised um, that we did this in the sense that I don't think it'd be that effective compared to, for example, speed bump. I'm also consider, concerned about the whack-a-mole. If you look at the, the stats, uh, we have seen Lincoln get more traffic, and I suspect some of the traffic that was coming down here has been moved to Lincoln. And so are we just now going to create another problem. Now the people in Lincoln will have to come back and say, you have to address this. Uh, the other thing is that these are really ugly right now. <laughs> and I'm concerned about putting concrete because if we don't have much money, we're going to do the really ugly, cheap version and we're going to make matters worse. Uh, for example, the, the ball boat. I, if you filled that with concrete, I would not want that in front of my house. If you filled it with flowers, maybe I'd want it. Uh, and so I think that the final design is, in, is very important, very critical to say whether we want it. If we can't fill that flower, that bulb out with flowers or something that's pretty, then we should be looking at speed bumps or something else. But if we could, so there's a lot of trade-offs here. Uh, and the other thing is the city does not have a lot of money right now. And I think two, two issues with that. One is we may have higher priorities elsewhere we can spend this money. And I don't want to be forced into making something really ugly just because that's all we can afford. Uh, so my personal preference would be to kick the scan down the road another year and let's see, uh, people are going back to the office now and maybe we'll get another count a year from now where we have much better clarity about how well this is working. So I don't see the rush. I do think this is a, an issue and I think we do uh, need to address this, but I think we have to be thoughtful of this and not just say, well, it's time and make a decision. Commissioner Liu. A couple quick questions. Was there any pedestrian or cyclist data on any of the intersections? Transportation staff, that question is for you. Uh, we did not uh, collect uh, the, the pedestrians or the bicycle data. Uh, since the the initial uh, the concern was the cut through traffic uh, speeding and the unsafe driving behavior, uh, so we were uh, the concern was came specifically from the vehicle point of perspective, not the pedestrians or the bicycle point of perspective. However, we did uh, uh, wanted to take into account uh, for the bicyclist, and that's why we chose the number uh, location number three. Uh, by the university and the West Crescent Drive uh, to protect the bike lane. And that's where we thought that the bikers are uh, maybe at risk uh, due to this uh, driving behavior and cut through traffic. And 
can staff kind of give context or talk about the literature or best practices around turning radiuses and whether the tighter turn, turning radius materially makes that intersection safer or if there's like a industry standard ex expectation that like tightening the turning radius will reduce accidents by X percent on average. Like, is there any data or best practice or study here? So, uh, so in general, uh, for the radius uh, from engineering, speak, strictly speaking from the engineering point of perspective, uh, when, when we were doing the pilot installation, uh, we wanted to look at the fire uh, uh, trucks, uh, make sure the fire emergency vehicle access is cleared. Uh, we want to make sure the garbage truck can easily go through that. So those are the biggest uh, 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 radiuses that we would encounter. And uh, during the design phase before the pilot, we did uh, have the, the, the radius calculated uh, from the consultants uh, to and send it out to us to make sure that uh, everything moves. Uh, all In a sense, all size of vehicles move uh, efficiently uh, through the through the uh, uh, bulb out and as well as the old shaped circle. So uh, yeah, to answer your question, we could have bigger, but then uh, the fire truck would not be able to move. They would have to move over the old shape and we would have to design based on that uh, as well. Yeah, to add to the question, Commissioner Lu, is that yes, uh, the greater the radius on the intersections, um, the higher the speeds generally, because it, it gives easier maneuverability uh, for making the turning moments. So it, what Mr. Pancho was saying was more towards the uh, the, uh, the traffic circle uh, radius, but uh, your question may be more pertaining to the curb returns uh, and the greater the radius is usually that uh, uh, poses more um, uh, incentive to speed through the intersections because it makes it easier to traverse. So in residential and in downtown and in more business district areas, the practice is generally to reduce the radiuses um, to a uh, practical means that can accommodate the vehicular moments and also tighten the radius to the maximum feasible. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Templeton, you want to go again or? Okay, go, then I'll go. Okay, sorry, just following up on some of these questions. Um, so first first of all, the uh, comments from Commissioner Aiken and Commissioner Liu are exactly on point, like the data we've been measuring has only been vehicular data. And that is not the origin of the complaint primarily. The origin of the complaint is the pedestrian vehicular conflict. Right, so we do need to be able to measure that. Um, and it sounds like there's um, not only a discussion about traffic calming, but we also have a discussion about the control that's not effective. And so I'm, I'm wondering if you have collected data that uh, would substantiate what we've heard from our eyewitness who sees this multiple times a day from his office. Do you, have you been able to, to see how effective that control is? Um, Chirag, have you not, um, been to that oh. intersection, noticed any tra uh, uh, three-way stop sign uh, maneuvering? Can, can, you, can you repeat the questions regarding the, the last few sentences? Uh, is it regarding the three-way stop sign at the Southwood East Crescent Drive? Yes, yeah, so that we had a we had a testimony tonight from a public comment about someone who oversees from his office um, the the challenges and problems with people complying with that traffic control, the three way stop sign at point number two on our maps. And if first, I want to know, have you observed that? And if so, what are we doing about it? And if not, why not? Sure. Uh, so I did observe it. I did go multiple times uh, before the pilot uh, pilot installation. Uh, the Y intersection is, uh, and uh, you could, before the installation, you could swirl around. And I have seen uh, uh, many drivers would swirl around that uh, from uh, Crescent Drive to Southwood Drive and basically a cut through traffic. Uh, after installation, I drove multiple times as well. and. Uh, 
I have a big car. I drove pilot as well. I drove city car, all kind of stuff. And then just wanted to get the feel for it because uh, because on paper, it looks different. When you go into the field, it's completely different. So right. I noted the point down that uh, the, the residents mentioned it's it's too tight. Uh, but we can definitely look uh, into the design, and this is where this is this is the reason why we wanted to go to the we want to have a pilot. We don't want to put it a permanent because this is the kind of challenges and issues comes in. Uh, so we can adjust a little bit here and there. Uh, so just to have the the curb cut, uh, the sorry, not the curb cut, the uh, the design, the the bulb out is to reduce the the radius and the width of the. Uh, intersection so that way it's a uh, it forces the drivers to uh, to slow down and so does the so does the stop sign effectively works on that uh, the second point that I noted uh, noted was that uh, the stopping sign and uh, I think the resident mentions that people are not stopping uh, and uh, I think that's more of a poor driver behavior or the code enforcement issue uh, if if there is a stop sign, I think uh, it's the CVC code that the vehicle, uh, the drivers must stop before they they proceed. Uh, yes, I mean, okay, uh, fair enough. Yes, people should obey the controls that are there. But if we're if we're saying that this this uh, traffic calming bulb out or whatever we want to call it is designed to make it safer, I think it, we can understand why somebody would be frustrated if stop signs are still being run. And if there was something that our design could focus on that would have higher safety impact than what we've done. So that's, I think, the question. And the reason I'm, I'm going through this is because we have, and this addresses Commissioner Rechtal's comments, we have the ability to move this forward but there's a chance and possibly a high chance that if we do move it forward, that the design process will think, oh, we're approving the design that has been implemented during the pilot. And I think there are problems with that design. That's what we're hearing from the neighborhood is, sure, I'm all about traffic calming, pedestrian safety, but we've heard about how it's ugly. We can address that in the design process, but we haven't explicitly yet tonight talked about maybe it's not the perfect design in terms of traffic calming and maybe there was something we can explore like do we have to go with if we move forward tonight do we have to go with the design of the traffic calming thing that's there or can we get feedback from the neighbors about what needs to be improved commissioner templeton um if i may add um we can work with the residents and community to come up with uh, improving the existing the, the design in the pilot program, uh, such as curb radius, maybe add right. an element or other thing. Uh, uh, an aesthetic lot wise, like what Commissioner uh, Rechtel and the, the, the commission had indicated about the aesthetic elements that should be part of the incorporated uh, in order to proceed forward to the extent that's feasible and uh, uh, and drought resistance, like you're mentioning already that we, we need to be focusing on. So we will look at those elements and it can incorporate. And uh, at the time when we bring back uh, the, uh, the concept plan after seeking input from the uh, feed feedback from the community, we can at that point before construction because the design uh, paper uh, is different and so we could seek that input and feedback at that time if the if the commission so feels more uh, comfortable at that time and then uh, move forward with any uh, additional elements that may be uh, the help and at the same time we can do some additional data uh, like commissioner chang uh, recommended that uh, we should look further into the data and see if there is you know enforcement uh, and and also the practicality of the the design that we can look at uh, in the meantime. Thank you so much, Mr. Bhatti. I think that's a really important distinction as we head into our our um, decision tonight is to understand what exactly it means to move forward. So it sounds like um, staff is willing to speak to people explicitly seek out input and have a conversation with people who live in the affected intersections. Is that correct? Yes, we'll, we'll conduct a 
uh, a, a outreach to seek input and feedback from, especially from the ones who are in the front days and of course the entire neighborhood. I think that would be helpful. And you sound like you're willing to, um, as part of the design process, make adjustments to accommodate feedback, specific feedback, uh, which is great. And you don't, and it sounds like you mean uh, not just aesthetic feedback, but functional feedback. So with that, for me, I'm a lot more satisfied about moving forward because there are some adjustments that need to be made. And I want to celebrate that we've done the, the pilot because that's really important and we should do more of those. But I also want to acknowledge that there are some uh, functional and aesthetic changes that need to be made to what we piloted in order for us to make it permanent. Thank you. Thanks. And now the chair is going to exercise her right to speak. So little background. I lived through the college chairs, very extensive. It might have been 20 years ago, um, traffic calming program. And I was the fortunate uh, recipient of a traffic circle at the end of my driveway, basically. And I will say one thing, it's very hard to find the perfect solution. I know traffic circles inside and out. And it took me eight years, we voted as a neighborhood on landscape traffic circles, and it took me eight years of pestering the city, eight years to get it landscaped after that's what we were promised. So we don't wanna see that happen again. So I think we should be sure we are gonna landscape these before we uh, vote on them. I think these three things are very different. I think the oval circle is kind of a no brainer and I've driven it a lot. And I think it definitely improves the functionality and safety of that in intersection. I will say that the design of what is in front of Mr. Duran's house and the impact on him personally is not acceptable. It is bizarre and um, way, it looks way too big to me. The beauty of a speed table is you go over it too fast, it wrecks your car. And uh, <laughs> nobody, cares, nobody cares about a stop sign when no cop is looking, a lot of people. You put up a whole bunch of stop, new stop signs in neighborhoods and people will purposely run them. So, and it is totally unacceptable to have uh, curbs, which have to be kind of mountable for emergency vehicles with nothing inside them because they become trash receptacles. And I had eight years of that. People started dumping sofas in them and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and they are much, much whether they're circle circles or oval circles, they are much safer when landscaped because they're much more visible. So I would be willing to move ahead. And I am sort of trusting staff on university that that's the right solution there and that it's important to have it just at that small diff distance. I would be happy, and no one has complained about the oval circle, I would be happy to move ahead with making those permanent, if they can be making that permanent, if it can be landscaped, it is unacceptable to have it landscaped in my opinion. Uh, not landscaped. Not landscaped, sorry. And I think Mr. Duran's bub out needs to be rethought completely, to be honest. And I'm fine with university if bike people are fine with that and we haven't heard from anybody. I wouldn't bike down University Avenue to test it, frankly. Do we know, has Payback uh, have an opinion on this? I don't know if the um, our staff um, consulted Payback, but... Um, yeah, staff, uh, this uh, this particular item did not go to the payback, but we did not hear any uh, negative feedback or comment from either the resident or payback or any other members uh, regarding those. Improvements. Yeah, well, that's good. I will mention that payback does not um, represent all the bikers in the community um, it, because there are children and older people biking, too, that aren't as athletic. But anyway, I don't know if my colleagues would be interested in moving ahead on the oval and the university solution with the um, um, uh, with the condition that it be landscaped in a manner that is discussed with the neighborhood. 
and rethink the one at East Crescent, which I call Mr. Duran's. Um, I think that's a good solution. I think in order to get the funding for the rethinking, we may have to include um, point number two in the motion. Even I think the, you well, know, they can all be in the motion, but yeah. to, I mean, to, to say to explicitly, move, yeah, that. Um, so I don't know if somebody that that's my thinking. I see a light from. Oh, and I do want to thank staff because this is actually pretty quick work on traffic calming, <laughs> quick response time for the city. So I think that deserves mentioning. And I think that's mostly all I had to say. And I, it, the other thing that's really hard to do with traffic calming is the whack-a-mole effect. It's just, it's very hard to do. I, I was involved in it for years, but um, that's in general what I think works and what really doesn't work so far. So I will call on, on didn't you want to speak? Did you want to speak? I would like to speak. Yeah, yeah okay. You don't want to speak? Okay. Yeah, I just want to give a couple of takes. Um, tighter turning radiuses are empirically safer, I believe. So even if you can't measure an improvement directly in like stop sign compliance or speeds, it is actually safer for pedestrians who might cross that street. And I think we can make the landscaping work and staff can move quickly on this. For East Crescent? Yeah, for the East Crescent, uh, Southwood uh, turn off. So I feel like it could be thrashy to actually punt this forward and maybe wait another year, maybe do a whole other cycle of design when we already will have a cycle of design and community meetings as part of this, uh, or at least part of staff's like proposed next steps uh, if we approve this as a permanent or if we recommend this to be permanent. Um, so I'm comfortable just approving all of these. And we can give further direction to try to accelerate this or to try to commit to landscaping as soon as we can, maybe at the council level. Okay, uh, okay I have a couple more lights. Commissioner Rechtel? Yeah, I don't think we have the money to do both of them right. I'd rather do one of them right and kick the other one down the road until we have more money. and. So to me, the obvious one to do right would be the traffic circle. Commissioner Templeton. Um, with respect, I think the money argument is irrelevant to this body's discussion. Um, whether or not council wants to finance it, that's up to them. And if they want to choose which one to finance, that's fine. Um, I agree partially with what Commissioner Liu said about um, trying to combine the design cycle. And I think, you know, the compromise here is nobody here wants us to build out permanently the design that is currently at point number two. It's not good, but it needs to be designed and re redesigned as part of the same study. Um, and so I, I, I would like us to move forward with very clear instructions in an optimistic way and leave the option for council to uh, downsize if needed, if you think that would be appealing, Commissioner Rechtel. I, I think something has to be addressed there. I'm not convinced that this is the right solution. I think maybe traffic, um, uh, speed bumps might be a better solution than this, but... Uh, um, can we study it? Oh yeah. I, I mean that's that's really I, I'm not I'm not opposed to this. I just think two constraints. One, we better make sure put some thought behind it and look at other options. And number two, be able to make it look attractive enough. I think the thing that's different about East Crescent is that when you attach that kind of oddly shaped from my point of view, and much bigger in the looking in the uh, uh, photo that Commissioner Templeton found it looks like an extension of his yard and it just looks awful. And so it, I don't think some, it, because there's no sidewalks, it really looks like a, an extension of his yard also. And so I have a bulb out too in front of my house, just so you know. 
<laughs> so um, I think that one just, I think that is so much about his property and his daughter's property that it needs to be designed with them. And it, it more explicitly also, because I mean, even if you left it the way it was and landscaped it, it would look, it would make his property look weird. I, and, and, and you write that um, bulb outs at narrowing the intersection are safety devices, but this one just doesn't look right to me. So I would entertain a motion if everybody's ready. I'm happy to do so. And I just want to say that I think it's, it's a matter of being explicit. What you just said, Chair, needs to be in the motion that the current design is not acceptable and further study is required. Would that be okay? Okay. Uh, just a second. Um, I requested a, um, a chance to speak. So if you're, when you're done, may I follow up? Uh, I was just gonna make a motion per chair's request. So please speak. Okay, uh, just, we need to be careful here because we're second guessing a lot of engineering that's already been done. Um, so, I wasn't privy to the discussions that resulted in these particular designs. Some of them seem intuitively right. Um, the, uh, the one that doesn't seem intuitively right may yet be the best solution, but I haven't seen the alternatives that were already ruled out. So I, I hesitate to give too much direction to staff um, about what should be there when they may have already considered that, and we simply don't know the outcome of those discussions. Um, I am not sure that design has happened yet. So I'm not sure we're second guessing engineering design because that's what we're gonna try and move forward with. You know, the pilot. The pilot is the result of a design process, which included a lot of public input as well. It is, it is certainly not the level of design we're asking for if we move it forward. Um, I understand the concern and I appreciate it actually, but I also have a strong sense of my own ignorance about what went into that decision. Uh, so I'm just reluctant to uh, second guess staff on that. How about I give it a try with the motion and if you have comments, oh, chair. Oh, uh, I mean, I'll just second Commissioner Aiken's comments. Um, it, should empirically be safer. Like we've done design work, we've done community meetings and the neighborhood by large supports it by a pretty healthy margin. And I think the aesthetic concerns and the aesthetic design concerns are really significant and can be addressed. But I think the actual safety and traffic calming design feels difficult to second guess at this point, given that we might just kick the can down for several more years and delay other implementations on other roads. It's not a design. We haven't approved design yet. That phase has not happened yet. And there's more than one way to have a turn radius at that intersection. And so I, I do agree that we don't have a design to reject, but I do also agree with the comments we've heard from other commissioners that what we're seeing is problematic and requires further study. And we should encourage that. And I think that you, you are also agreeing with that. Yeah, I okay. agree. And I think, you know, if we move forward explicitly, there will be a design process uh, in the next steps on the bottom of packet page 25. So I think we maybe just agree. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to give it a try, and if you guys, uh, if anyone's uncomfortable with this, please speak up and we can workshop it, okay? But um, let's see if I can find the recommendation. So planning, uh, I move that Planning and Transportation Commission recommends the City Council approval of permanent installation of traffic calming pilot project, which includes a uh, point one uh, to be permanent installed and point three to be permanently installed with adequate landscaping, preferably uh, not drought tolerance, not the right word, um, local. <laughs> What's the word? Native. Native. Thank you. Native. I'm have drawing a blank. I'm getting, it's getting late for me. Um, with, preferably with native landscaping and preferably 
timed within a very short amount of time from the installation. And then to also um, take further steps to improve the design of point two at Crescent and Southwood such that it is as safe, if not safer than what's there while being more aesthetically pleasing and suitable to the adjacent properties. Okay. Um, Suggestions? Awesome. Well, um, Mr. Bati, so if we can wait for a second till after he has a chance. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, and I actually, I was going to say that the refinement of that design, uh, the pilot design is the plan of the engineering department. So if that is the intent to refine and seek input from the fronting property owners, that is the intent of the uh, our, our, our uh, next steps. I'll second. Okay, I have, would you like to speak to your motion, Mr. Templeton? Yes, I'll be brief. Okay. I know it's late. Um, just, just to uh, to say that we we do have pilots for a reason. That's because we want to try with something that's reasonable and see how the feedback is going. And I understand uh, staff is saying that engineering decisions were involved in the pilot, as I would expect. But we're sending point number where the motion is to send point number two back for another iteration with input closer input from the adjacent properties. Thank you. I'd like to speak to the second. I do think that um, one and three seem pretty ready to go, but point number two does need work. And um, in response to what an earlier commissioner said about this is empirically safer, I don't think that we can say that because the data shows that there was an accident there in a time during a pandemic when there was greatly reduced traffic. And we don't know that that the reductions that we've seen in traffic volume and speeds are real because of the pandemic. So um, we know that the collision data at least isn't apples to apples. And we have uh, data from an eyewitness that there are collisions there. So clearly we, we want to see if this can be made safer as the motion states. And um, yeah, so I do have a question. Does that redesign include or exam does that include entirely different options as well, such as speed tables? I don't see why not. Okay. I mean, that's what we're discussing. They've okay. heard the feedback here and that's what commissioners are suggesting. So do we need to be more explicit about that? Because I don't want to say that we're specifically signing off on a bulb out. I so mean, if 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 the if the design team were to say, oh, and now we think that actually here a speed tables would be better, I certainly wouldn't want to, I don't want to preclude that. <laughs> so let's let's add that point number three should come back before the commission with the next iteration. Point number two. Uh, point number two, thank you. Um, so that uh, we can confirm that our feedback was incorporated because we have heard a couple of different ideas here that might be more suitable. Uh, we, we recognize you're not prepared tonight to speak to every kind of possibility that was considered, but don't come back to us with the same design. Or at least come to us with an evaluation of other potential, or, you know, if a reason why certain other ideas here might not be good ones. That seems fair to Okay, so. But. Amended but, and seconded. Yes, and just, <laughs> just to clarify for staff, because I can see you guys looking at us, what, what we're saying is don't come back to us before going to council. Go to council, talk about, we want to have safety improvements in these three areas. Two are ready to go, one needs an iteration. Commissioner. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, Chair, uh, Chair, I'd like to add that any traffic calming device will need to go through the voting process again through the residential community in order to be approved by the city council or the city engineer. So as for a recommendation from the staff. So we follow the traffic calming process, which requires voting, and it has to be a majority vote supporting the 
the, the improvements. So if we are changing or deviating from the currently approved voting mechanism, then we would have to redo the entire process for that particular intersection. Uh, just for that one intersection, correct? Correct. So okay. if we were to move forward with the redesign efforts, then we would have to go back to the community, see the entire community feedback and that entire process. And we might have to go back and do another uh, pilot program for that intersection separately. Are, are you saying that you would try to push through this one because you feel that you have the votes for that instead of taking the feedback we've given tonight? No, we will take the feedback, but if we were to change the, the design, like if we are adding a speed table or some other elements rather than refining the existing design that were, was proposed, like say mm -hmm. if we were to refine the d design of the uh, bulb out and, and massage it to work with the property owner to make sure that their access is maintained, to make sure that the landscaping and other elements are included and the maneuverability of the location and things are safer so so we we could do all those kind of iterations to the, the design that was proposed but if we were to change the element like from a bulb out to say a traffic circle or if the community comes back and tells us we put, need another traffic circle here or if we need a um a a a, a uh, speed, uh, speed humps through the intersections and other, okay, other things, then that would need to go through another process of traffic humming, which is in accordance with our traffic humming policy. Well, thank you for letting us know that part about the process. So really we're leaving this up. If, if this motion passes, we're leaving it up to you to work it out with the neighbors, uh, which you know ideally would have been done before it comes to us this time. And it's unfortunate that we're not able to approve uh, this one right now. Um, but like it needs this, it's not there yet. No, Commissioner Templeton, that's all the intent. We want to okay. move forward with this, cons uh, this, this, cons it's like an initial pilot. We will refine to prepare a con concept plan that will share that will be planned after in getting input and feedback from the community and then come back at 35% level, say concept plan to the com to the commission, uh, to the PTC, and then seek their blessing in moving forward with the final design. That can That's something we can do. Um, Commissioner Rechtal. Yeah, I mean, the one thing that makes me uncomfortable is that I have to think that someone looked at things like speed bumps or whatever and it would really help us if we knew why they were not uh, accepted. Generally, it's the neighborhood residents that are not in favor of those. Uh, that's because they cause noise. They cause uh, other elements of uh, nuisance when, when installed. And also for fire access, you have to provide for the, uh, for the uh, uh, wheels uh, spacing in these uh, speed humps when, or when they are installed in the neighborhood streets. Um, and so, and the, the, the frequency or the location, uh, the, the, the repetition of that to be effective needs to be there. So it has to be like a pair of three or four and printing property owners will lose parking. So there are so many other negative effects that may have been discussed with those property owners and community before, in, and they may have already ruled out that speed humps were not appropriate for that so, community. So does the transportation department have some document that describes this, what we went through? what was considered and why it was rejected? Um, I do not have the entire document, but I, I'm, uh, you know, I can check with our staff to see if they, uh, some of that staff do not exist. <laughs> they, they are not here anymore. And so we may not have the historical information, but my understanding is that speed humps generally are, uh, uh, if we want to start the speed hump process, that would be a separate process. We need to go through their own qualification process also. So I don't think our intention was to redesign that area tonight, um, but just to say that we weren't happy. And the one person, two people of the three people that came and spoke tonight, well, did not really, who were property owners, really didn't want it. So I think that we shouldn't get try to tell the experts what's better. I bet they had a couple other choices and um, 
second choices or um, that were, were considered, but I don't want to redesign it tonight. I just want to, if, if nobody wants to make an amendment, I think we should just vote on it and see if it passes. Is that, is that? Can, can we restate the motion for clarity? I mean, for- uh, I for knew you were gonna ask that. I don't <laughs> know if I remember the whole thing. <laughs> so let me restate the motion. The motion is to move to uh, make permanent uh, numbers one and numbers three, but number three only with the condition that it be landscaped and that we think number two needs more work. Maybe it just needs to be refined as a bulb out that's more suitable with more conditions that meet, um, that are better, but with with input directly of adjacent property owners. Yes. So it needs more work, but it will be up in the interim and also uh, just evaluated by council when it comes to them. Yeah, and I mean that's much simpler than what Commissioner Templeton said, but I think it. Just want to confirm. Yeah. So sh should we explicitly say that the temporary one stays in place until it's redesigned or just leave that out? I think that's already a part of the process. Great. Okay. Everybody ready to vote or do we have any, did we need it? Part of that also, or part of her motion was also that uh, specific to number two, that it would come back to PTC after, assuming that council approves uh, the recommendation from us. Okay. And that, that number two will come back to the planning commission. We'll bring back all three of them for your review, uh, both of them for your review, because it might have a landscaping component and re redesign efforts. So the whole project will come back to you at concept level 30, like when the concept level plans are ready after seeking input and feedback. That's so. what, thank you. That's what I thought. We don't need to say that because they're all, it's all coming back to us. Okay. Can you please conduct the vote? Commissioner Templeton? Yes. Chair Suma? Yes. Commissioner Rectal? Yes. Commissioner Liu? No. Vice Chair Chang? Yes. Commissioner Aiken? Yes. Motion carries 5 1. Okay. Thank you, everyone. And thank you to the members of the public who stuck it out for this conversation. And I think that means we. Oh, I'm sorry. Would you like to speak your no vote? I mean, I think my opinion is clear. It like is safer um, and it's just less thrashy and I don't think we need the thrash. Okay, thank you for that. And then our last item this evening is approval of minutes, draft verbatim and summary minutes of May 10th. Do I have a motion? Nobody wants to make a motion. Bart's not here. <laughs> yeah, Bart's not here. Uh, I move that we accept the uh, draft verbatim and summary minutes of May 10th, Second. 2023. Uh, Chair Suma? Yes. Vice Chair Chang? Yes. Commissioner Aiken? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Liu? Yes. Commissioner Rectal? Yes. Commissioner Templeton? Yes. Motion carries 6 0. Thank you for that. And now, um, and thank you to the, again to the public. And now we just go on to commission questions, comments, announcements. And we already have future agendas as part of our packets. Does anybody have anything in particular? I see um, Templeton and Rectal then. I am in Sacramento that day, and I will try to get back in time, but might be late or might not make it. So just so you know. OK, thank you for that. Um, or I guess I should add 28th and the next meeting, I will both be on travel on both those. I will 
Plan to call in. Okay, so the 28th, you're going to call. 28th and the. The 17th. Of and then what's the next one? 7th, 12th. 12. 12, yeah. So participate, sorry. So participating remotely. Yes. And providing in advance your. I'll send you the my hotel own. location yeah. or what have you. Yes. I'll get the reservations. Okay, in. we're in a new, uh, new old environment. Okay, if there are no other comments, then the meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone.